Poppycock Podcast with Victor Pacheco. Hello. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Poppycock Podcast with your host, Victor Pacheco. We have a really excellent show for you guys today. Uh, Bay Area royalty in the comedy community. My friend, Mr. Tony Kameen. <laughs> How you doing, brother? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing actually really good, man. It's great to have you on my show, Poppycock Podcast, man. It's my first time. I I am a big fan of the show since I was a little kid, so I'm I'm excited to finally be on it. <laughs> and you look better on Zoom than you do on Facebook. You look <laughs> taller. <laughs> Oh my God, that's fucking great. I just literally, <laughs> I've, I've, I've got to be the only one. It's like, no, no, your photos that like uh, from your $750 photo shoot for your, for your headshots look like shit, but in person you look a lot better. And it's like, you know, I got the bright lights on me too. Like I did during that shoot. So thank you for the compliment. Or back and, your the compliment. <laughs> and your house is just so, I mean, I've been drinking, so everything's a little blurry, but your house is beautiful. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, drinking or not, man, it could have <laughs> just been an astigmatism. Uh, but, like, yeah, dude, uh, thank you so much for joining us or joining me today and our viewers. Hey, Victor, I, I love your passion for comedy that I used to have. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me, dude? I, I, uh, I don't know if it's like if you call it passion or obsession. There's a huge okay. difference. Because, They're both uh, great perfumes. <laughs> Did you say perfume? Yeah, fragrances. They're both <laughs> passion, obsession, grinder, <laughs> grinding. Come through. I thought you were making. I thought you were making a metaphor right now. I didn't know that <laughs> you were making a reference to fragrances no. by Calvin Klein. Obsession. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they sound like fragrances. Oh my God, man! You make everything sexy, Tony. I, I should have had you on earlier. I'm sorry. Except sex, oddly enough, I make that real <laughs> clinical and. <laughs> Sterile. Oh, man, sterile. You even said sterile, sterile. Sterile. Was, I don't, sterile. I don't, sterile. Want, I don't think you want to say sterile in a sex environment. You want to say sterile. It sounds less <laughs> sexy. Uh, well, it's kind of like fat. You don't want to say fat. You want to say fat. 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 You want to say, you want to say morbidly obese. Yeah, or uh, Chubsick in American. Anything. Oh, I like that one. Yeah, man. That's like, that's yeah. me right there. I'm just like fucking like starting out. Dude, where did I meet you? I either met you at the layover or I met you at the San Francisco punchline on, on a Sunday for the show. You did a layover. Uh, dude, it was on a Tuesday. I think it was a Mike Spiegelman show. It was yeah, like one speaks. of those. Yeah, dude. Like, uh, it was like a Tuesday. It was, dude, the thing about Mike's shows was like literally, it was either we're performing for all the other comics or it was like super packed or there was like five people. It was like, but also though, too, I remember sometimes where there was like 25, 30 people, but they would be like oddly spaced out. And so the yeah, last yeah, would be yeah. coming from here, from there, from there. And it's just like, I don't know. I've done some rooms where the host is like, oh, don't worry. If you can't hear the laughs, it's just the acoustics. I'm like, no, nobody's getting laughs. Nobody's getting You're laughs. You're like, there's at all. no. There's no humans here. I, where who's laughing? The chairs? The, oh yeah, the I know. Olive, you know, it's like. And then everybody on that Tuesday night is just—I don't know. When you first start off comic, oh, I watch your set. If you watch mine, oh, great. And that the layover is just like, all right, when am I up? <laughs> when am I? I, up? Liked, I thought it was a fun place, and you know. Oh, I thought it was great. I thought... And then, like a month later, I'm watching the movies, and it's in the, it's in, uh, you know, it's it's in the movie. Oh, I forgot which one. Oh, I forgot which one it was too. It was like super big. It was uh, yeah, that was crazy too. I was like, Dude. sorry to bother you. I think, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that was Jamal taken... and uh, NATO and all those guys are in it. Dude, that's awesome, man. Like that was uh, really like also too like one of my um, um reasons in having you into the show is I wanted to know more about SF stand up comedy history because I was reading that you're part of the whole the San Francisco Holy Zoo, and for people at home that don't know that, that's uh in on Clement Street in San Francisco, and that is in the Marina District, correct? It's in the Richmond District. Richmond, yeah. sorry, yeah. sorry. I was just really it's, bougie. It's sixth, uh, was it Fifth and Clement, something like that? It's uh, right, yeah, it's something else now, but they have comedy like right next door at Neck of the Woods. Yeah. Uh, I was on Clement. That's, yeah, that's right next door. And I went back there around Christmas. I think Howard, legendary SF comic Howard Stone was having a birthday party and, and show, so I showed up to that. Oh, and that's not awesome. much has changed. It's pea soup, fog, sleepy businesses, Chinese restaurants, and that, and and some jokes being told on a cold, freezing summer. <laughs> that was a winter night, but it could might, might as well have been a summer night in the Richmond district. Yeah, that was the zoo right there. Sixty 
I think max occupancy was maybe 64 or something like that. Crazy. Dude. Yeah. I was in there. It was like, I, there was like uh standing room only standing room only. It's like really like, uh, you have to have chops to perform in that room too. Actually, when I was there, because there was like a, there was a showcase slash open mic, like back in like 2012, 2014 ish. At it the was, new place or the old place? No, at the old place at the same oh. place, but it was like under a new name. And so uh -huh. um, it was like, it was like really cool, but it was just like, kind of like, it was like a carnival, so to speak. Like it was just like this really like rowdy type of atmosphere that was like something you would expect like in San Jose or Redwood city or Modesto. And it was like, Holy shit. Everyone's getting That's like shit. how it was. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I loved it. Okay. So like, like how would a typical, I know like, because this is a hard question because like with uh you could go to the same venue every single night of the week, like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And it, like, you could have the same exact audience, but it'll be a different vibe every night. So like, how, how, how has the vibe, is, is the vibe the same or has it changed since uh, when you started uh, with the Holy Zoo and you started in the nineties, correct? I started in the very late eighties, like 89. Um, well, things have just, audience members have changed. It's gotten more like, like music where it's more segregated. Like, Oh, I don't want to see a guitar. Com you know there's so much more comedy now it's a million times for comedians there's all and there's all these different kinds so you're and you can it, there's does you know you have internet now you could see oh this guy's playing what's he i'm gonna look him up there was none of that you're just like com comedy you know and there's some people that you know dana carvey was kind of a big name robin williams of course but let you know if you watch letterman you see someone come through the zoo oh they were on that sh they, you know there wasn't there, there was only the late night talk shows for exposure really and word of mouth but the zoo is really good. You look at these old calendars and, and they get all of, you know, everybody was doing it. I saw some of those calendars, man. It was really epic. I'm like, fuck, that was a $8 show. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, uh, or like a $4 show or something ridiculous. It was like single digits. Like it's like all-star lineup. Now granted $8 or $4 in the eighties was way more than it is now because of inflation and everything else. But um, yeah. The yeah. And also maybe the talent isn't, as developed at it as it is when they're famous, you know, a young, a young Ellen DeGeneres, you know, a young, a young, young all, Rick, all these people, Jake Johans, you know, you know, the people we started with. Um, but it was so great. It was such a great place to, to, to hang out every night. It was such a small little club, you know, and like, it, it just hurt from laughing every night for whatever. There was horrible nights there. It was so small. Like it, you know, it could turn a couple people could turn that whole thing around just, just by sitting down and being audience members. Cause uh oh. it was just where people went it went everybody did their shows at the punt there was there's the um there was cobs and the punchline and, and improv came later but like people would uh just go there after their show it, everybody went there after their show so you know you'd be in your sweats and then some <laughs> some some like warren thomas would come in in a suit or greg proops you know coming from the main clubs and it was like oh okay something to shoot for there's they're working the big rooms you know which took a took a year or two to get into at that time you know Oh my God. So, yeah, but, it, but you saw them all and they would go up and you're like, well, okay, okay. This is definitely the headquarters of comedy in this town, you know? Well, without saying any names, like were these comics like more encouraging to the new comics or were kind of like get the fuck out of my way, watch and learn? Or like, what was the attitude? I know it varies from comic to comic, but I mean, like overall, was it more generally, nurtured? generally very, very helpful. Larry, Larry Brown, still same, same MO as today, would take new comics under their wing and take them to horrible one nighters and stop at <laughs> Stop at Carl's Jr. and Cordelia to get a chicken sandwich because <laughs> he liked that one better. You know, bother waitresses all over servers. We'll stop it. There was Walnut Creek Punch. He'd stop in, harass the wait staff for about 20 minutes, get back on the road, you know, go to his one-nighter. Uh, <laughs> so, but he would, he would take, I think he still does this. He'd take, um, you know, he takes a shine to some young comics and takes them out with them. There was a lot of that, but there's also a lot of like earning respect where people didn't take you serious. I don't want to say anyone who, who was... Don't people say who, names, but I want, I'm like, plus people, people who might not have paid attention to me love my friend. So as you know, it's like, like people have different experiences, like you said, with different, different acts and different people. But yeah, I, I was mostly helped greatly, you know, with by Larry Brown, Karen Anderson, who I'm still friends, Alex Reed, who's my, still my friend to this day. Um, they were, they were more developed, but they were so, so helpful. And, you know, because there's these like different thoughts of comedy in that like, sh because like, there's a lot of comics that are very, very mean to their openers and their bullies because that's how they were brought up. And then now, and then I open for some people 
Uh, okay, so I can't name the the ones like that, but the good ones I can. Like like Pablo Francisco, he's like the sweetest heart. He's very. Oh, nice. he'll share his coke with you. He's great. <laughs> you know what's fucked up? No, I've never ever. I'm kidding. I, I, no, no, no I, I know, but for the record, like I've never ever done that with him. Yeah. I've I've my days of doing all that shit are long behind me, and you know, thank God, like you know, that would have been a horrible mix. Pablo at his worst and me at my worst. It would have been bad because I had cartel connections. Oh, uh, but yeah, like ser- like $30 a gram type of shit. Like stupid, stupid. Like off the kilo too. It was not cut. Like, you know, like you give it to uh, people. Let's, that- let's talk after we hang up. I think I, <laughs> no, I got to guy- pay this mortgage off. <laughs> this guy's since been deported. I don't know where no. he's at, but um, he's part of my act. But um, what's it called? Yeah, no, no, no. Um, it's it's uh, actually Pablo's really been really sweet with me. And like, I found out that we have some mutual friends that are like in the writing world. And then like for Pablo to be like, you're in the writing world. I'm like, you're in the writing world. And Pablo's like, you know, been like somebody that I've known for like, or known of his work for like over 20 years. So to be able to like him because I thought like people tell me, don't meet your heroes. When you meet your heroes, you're going to be disappointed because it's not going to be the image that you, that you see them as. Publicly. Right. 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 And so they, they might break your heart. And so like, you know, um, when I met him, he was like, no, he was super supportive. And he told me that I did pretty good um, impressions and um, sound effects. And I'm like, dude, this is like the impressionist expert right here. It's like, yeah, yeah. Like that's very, very cool. Like, holy shit. He's like, hey, man, you're pretty funny, man. I really like your impression sound effects, dude. I'm like, thanks. Wow. Gee, I mean, oh, fuck. Thank God. I thank God I didn't know you were watching my set. I didn't yeah, know he yeah, was watching yeah. my set. That, that could have been like, oh, and, uh, um, you know, my hero is watching me right now. You guys here to see Pablo, right? It's sold out. Uh, you know, but. Uh, a good impression of somebody, too. I don't know who you're doing, but that's. No, no, thing. no. That's just me nervous. No, no, no. This is me. <laughs> no, no. I don't know anybody like that. Oh, I mean. What not you do a, is you, you come up with a voice and then find somebody who sounds like the voice and then I just say it's an impression. <laughs> no, that's great. I actually got offered to do a roast battle this Friday and like I'm not really a part of that culture with tearing down another person and or their family or loved ones or whatever trauma they're going through. I mean, if you're a, ra- a, a, a comedy roast battler, that's awesome. I, that's great if you could flex that muscle but for me that's not me that isn't what i do i like to like build my brothers and my sisters and stand up you know when i'm not being a well, here's a tip victor when you when, if you have to do it i know it's not your style so you know you shouldn't do stuff it's not your style but if you have to do it just yeah. pretend the person you're roasting is you and then you'll be you'll be like you fat mother like that <laughs> that's what i did you untalented fraud I saw a so video of you. Picture of a, you just put a mirror to that guy's face and it becomes so easy because oh comics God. hate themselves. <laughs> Dude, I, I saw a video of you where you refer to yourself as fat and I almost commented being like, hey, bro. Nah, dude, you can't be fucking culture appropriating like that, dude. Not cool. But then I was, I was just but then I was just like, you're going to take it as like face value. Like it's three o'clock in the morning. Why the fuck are you? What? Is he serious, right? Because these do not always translate the comments. So, like, I, I think I, I was three hundred. That counts. <laughs> okay, when you said it in the video, you then you wear you carry your three hundred pounds really well. And then you know, I see posts where you're like walking around and like I don't know, people claim. But see, you're like me. you're doing this, like like it's like that's how fat people walk. You're like, ah. That's yeah. why President V walking. Yeah, it's like, you know, a little T-Rex, you know, with the, with the dinosaurs, a little flapping arms and stuff. Yeah, that's me. Because even though I'm like six foot two, I'm six foot two by six foot two. So I look like a chode. So it's just like, you know, that's just but me. You, I don't know. I was a fat kid. I'm always going to be a fat in my head. And I, even, oh, I didn't know you were a fat kid. I don't know if now, it was like one of those things. Like I'm going to gross fucking, you out. I'm a... I'm like 145 pounds, but now, but like, I'm still, I'm still. Oh my God. You, oh, look at this. Oh my God. It's still, it's still fat. Like I'm always, oh I can't my God. even, oh. I went, to, I had my physical today at 11 yeah. and I'm like, he's like, you can't, you're, you're at good weight, but I'm like, I'm fucking fat still. And now I'm wrinkly and fat because I lost weight. It's horrible. I should have stayed fat. This year I'm going to get fat. I'm going to go You're get a big, I'm going to get a smash burger after this. I have it. <laughs> I'm about to pick you up in my Prius. We're going to go get some smash burger. What part of town you live in? This I live boring. in Santa Monica. Santa oh, Monica. Yeah. nice. Yeah, baby. I'm too I used to live out there. Ocean Park was nice. Oh, oh beautiful, man. It's great, except for the people. Um, I, I go to the dog park. Some woman, um, why does it have to be a woman? Because that's how it fucking happened. Uh, she brought her big dog into the little dog park, and her dog attacked my dog. And when I told her that her dog had no business being here and she just skedaddled and like my dog was like yelping super hard. And I can't believe she left without a fight. Those ladies usually, I mean, no offense, (laughs) but you know, they like to, 
Dude, no, and she didn't say any. Well, she told me to not touch her dog, and then I just went off on her. And I was just like, dude, you're lucky. Like, oh, actually, never mind. I'm not going to incriminate myself. But what happened was that I, w- I told her that I wish she was a dude so I could handle this differently. <laughs> End of story. I could just stay, yeah. say that. And because no, I Santa Monica is nice, and I miss the, I miss the over those, those marine layer mornings like the Bay Area where you get those nice, cool mornings. I where, miss it. Where are you at? I'm in this weird part of Glassell Park that's between, it's like basically Eagle Rock near between Glendale and Eagle Rock. Oh, nice. Other side of the five. It's the most farthest away from the ocean i've ever lived oh really oh oh i never looked at it like that like how far away i live from the ocean and like yeah. i just i mean i've always lived close to the ocean like santa cruz oakland san carlos yeah yeah me too santa I monica live. i lived in brooklyn santa monica san francisco mountain view but that's even closer yeah mountain view's not that i count bad. the bay i count the bay as ocean the bay is ocean as long as you don't count santa cruz as the bay but that is ocean though yeah but i've gone to arguments like santa cruz is a south like i don't know a central coast section type of thing Uh, santa cruz i think is his own bubble yeah santa cruz is great i love doing comedy in santa cruz santa cruz oh yeah dna is great guy too dna is great oh god it's a slip in my name but he's a good guy with uh, santa cruz mountain brewing company uh they have they have shows there every wednesday and um it's like 20 minutes, you know, they hook you up with like two beers. It's like, you know, not the greatest gig. It's 20 minutes though. But like, you know, if you're not doing anything on a Wednesday, you want to go see beautiful Santa Cruz. But um, I, I also, do love that Half Moon Bay gig is good up, up the street. Phil, the... Phil's, Phil's gig is great. Oh too. yeah. That's, that's a great room. Oh, that, that's that... one where you, it looks like it's going to be bad because it's like, Oh, it's this foggy little town. <laughs> it's, it's a beer place. But it's yeah. it's fun, man. That guy puts on a good show. They're rowdy too. I love it. They're, They're like no, well, my favorite thing about it is that I love watching Phil going up before the show. I don't know if he still does this. This was like years ago, way before the pandemic. That well, maybe not way before, but like you know, right before the pandemic, that uh, he was going up to tables and letting them know there's a comedy show going on and to please keep their um, table talk to a bare minimum. But he was doing it to like every group, and I was like, dude, what a sweetheart. Like instead oh, of making yeah. an annou- instead of making an announcement that's impersonal, he's going up to people, and it's funny. Is like like you know, Phil's Phil's fucking funny. He's a great host, and it's just like it's so funny because it's like you see him in producer mode, and it's like not the same Phil that you see at a show because like you know I, he's still the great guy, he's still a nice guy, but it's just like when you're in producer mode, you're just very concerned about the outcome of the show, making sure that you know everybody likes the show, making sure that none of your comics are too offensive or what or there's any kids in there in some cases. I did a show at a brewery in Ontario on Chris on um Halloween um this past Halloween and uh there was a s- 8 and a 9 year old in Ooh. the audience and I have this part where I was like repeat after me cocaína and this nine-year-old Mexican girl in the front row lifts up her arms and she's like, cocaina. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. That's I'm right. at least getting arrested, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's so are these parents. Yeah, yeah. That's in these, like, what are you doing? And of course, and I was like, you're Mexican, right? They're like, yeah, how'd you know? I was like, because you brought two kids to a brewery <laughs> on Halloween. That's like, oh no, they like the experience. I was like, no, no, no. You like not paying for a babysitter. We know. Yeah. We get it. I'm Mexican too. Yeah. You know, it's like, and so then I get into my routine or whatnot. So well, that's uh, Ontario. I'm sure in Alabama, it's like, wait, you're a redneck, right? Yeah. I mean, sure, it, it happens <laughs> all over, you know. Why don't just tell you what? No, well, yeah. I mean, you might as well go to Ukiah. You don't have to go all the way over there to experience. That's true. Racism. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I experienced some racism in Ukiah. And like, also, I was doing like anti Trump stuff, which was stupid because I'm not, a, I'm not a political That's brave comic. in Ukiah. I was just like, you know, like I was talking shit about Donald Trump, and some guy kept going, boo, boo. And it kept getting louder, boo. So I was just like, dude, don't boo me, blow me. And <laughs> everyone just laughed their ass off. <laughs> and like this other producer in Ukiah, Saw saw that saw me doing this for 25 minutes straight, and he's all like, "You're a fucking bona fide headliner. I want you to do 60 minutes of my." I'm like, "I just did 25 minutes, like, and I didn't do any. I did like, I'm not joking. Like, I saw every single comic on that show bomb because everyone attempted material, and nobody, not one person, went after that fucking heckler with the two chicks on this side and two chicks on that side, like they're all his ladies." You know what right. I mean? It was just like a, it was just like a show of, of masculinity and false bravado, but it wasn't anything that was just like, you know, so I had to call him out. 
I called him out. I told him I told him a lot of stuff and I called out his masculinity and everybody laughed at him. And I told him he had a small wiener and like, you know, it's just like that's why he's interrupting all the comics because he thinks he's big. But it, it, were, it, it went really well. I mean, it's way, way better than it's going right now with me retelling it. But um, what's it called? I have a question. So you were on Conan. Hold on. Hold on. There's something I, I can't believe <laughs> about this story. What? <laughs> There's two bookers that live in Eureka? Ukiah. Yeah, there's two, yeah, that's even smaller than Eureka. There's two, <laughs> bookers? There's yeah. two bookers that live in Ukiah. Well, actually, I think one lives in Ukiah and one lives in Sonoma, who is booking a show in Ukiah. Okay, which but is for them like, like one hour north. So, but still, there's two different or competing comedy. No, that's crazy because you know you, you do a bar show in the middle of nowhere. You're like, I hope there's no industry here, but no, <laughs> there's industry. <laughs> I was just like, okay, this is a perfect transition. You're like, wait a second. That doesn't make any sense. What the hell are you talking? That's bullshit. I'm calling bullshit right now. Cody Smith and uh god damn it, uh Jake Bernie. Those were the two dudes. So anyway, Jake Bernie. Yeah. So um um <clears throat> yeah, I've worked with Jake before. Jake's a cool dude. Um oh, I mean, just like all of us, we have our moments. I've gotten into a huge argument with him, and then one of my former friends broke the ice and like was like oh we get, we're back together but then i'm not friends with that guy anymore so, uh -oh. so we're, we're gonna get in a thing eventually oh uh, no maybe who cares well, we'll see we'll see you know we'll see, but then we'll be better for it after yeah you know we'll see what's up i mean right. I've, I've brought it up indirectly we can plan one like a plan beef that way we don't have the real one. <laughs> oh my god dude tony where have you been all my life i need you i mean dude no seriously because i was trying to get the numbers up on the zoom comedy show i was doing and i told the main i, I told the producer hey why don't I sue you in court for, for money that I feel you owe me? And then we go on the people's court and then people will tune in because it's like, oh shit, this is a real fucking fight. This is a real allegation. And like, you know, like I, we could even go on record. I call you dolphin teeth and you call me orca. And then, you know, we're like sea creatures and shit. And like, dude, we could like really play this out and we could really get some exposure. Yeah. And he's like, no, nah, yeah, yeah. dude, dude, that's a stupid idea. I'm like, it's not a stupid idea. It's stupid. No, dude, you owe me money. He's like, for what? I was like, you're in character, kind of creative okay. processes, making these like, like putting our faces on known images, like to Wong Fu. Thank you for everything. Julie Newmar. Like I put my face on top of Chi Chi Rodriguez's face. I don't know if you're familiar with that movie, but it was like, yeah, Patrick yeah, Swayze. but this is going back a little bit. Yeah, but he didn't get the reference, but I got it. And dude's my age. And I'm like, how did you get this reference? Well, how I do you not know? Hopefully the judge will get the reference. Hopefully the judge, yeah, whom, whomever it may be, you know, hopefully it's uh, one of those Latina judges, so they'll be on my side, and I'll get the money because I told him I was going to split it, but if I get the judgment, hell no, I'm not going to split that. <laughs> Fuck him. But uh, no, 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 I mean, there was a time and place for Zoom comedy, just not right now. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I mean, it did help me out during the pandemic a lot, but it's just like, I don't know, a lot of people, I don't know. I think a lot of people found out that they, like, I don't know, can't, I don't know, a lot of people that do crowd work only, and like we're on Zoom, it was kind of hard to watch. Uh, yeah, I do a lot of crowd work. I didn't do any Zoom shows. I did like four Zoom shows. Um, I like to be in the room. I like the tension of the room. You know, I, I'm a sloppy comic. I don't say the things the same way, but I like I like to go in and out of material, talking to the crowd. So I'm bad on TV and I'm horrible on Zoom. Oh, stop! No, I okay. You know, I, I, okay. I think I'm okay, but I think okay, uh, okay. okay. Those are my, that's where I have a feel like I have a hand. Okay, so you have to say it exactly like this. I feel like I have a hand tied behind my back. Oh my god, I feel like ugh. You have a, a hand tied around your throat too, because dude, no, you're wrong. L listen, okay, for the people at home. I do a lot of research for my guests. And listen, I just recently, like, watched Tony on, on Conan O'Brien. Okay, stop. Okay, and then Tony's all like, because I told him this before the recording. Hey, you know what? I just saw it. And he's like, oh, no. I was like, you got two applause breaks. Two that lasted, like, a long time. Yeah, because they light up a sign that says applaud or we'll kick you out. Okay, but it doesn't say applause break or we'll kick you uh -huh. out. No, no, I that know. applause break just, you know, you know, it was a long time ago. Modest. And, and then I was just like, wait, with the, other, with the glasses and the, the uh, yeah, I was just like, okay, this is, this is it. But if it wasn't like, I was just like, okay, yeah. Ah, yes. Okay. So I was just like, no, because I met you without glasses. Yeah. Yeah. I don't wear it. I don't really wear them anymore. No. And you have lost a lot of weight with the clips and all that stuff. What's your secret? Uh, I stopped drinking off and on and then car, you know, just really the carbs works. I, I don't really, 
love carbs, so it was easy, you know. Dude, I mean, oh, I love carbs and I love. I mean, now I do and- because I can't have them, but now I'm like, oh, is that bread off? But but uh, <laughs> it oh, was no. it was pretty easy. And my wife is helpful, you know. She gave me a sip of her old fashioned, so I don't have to order a whole one. Oh, uh, that's cool. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, what sucked with like stand up, it's like you'll you'll do a gig and. I don't know those free drinks that you get as a stand-up. It's like those aren't free drinks. You fucking earned them, and, and like they're not free because they're also if you've been <laughs> in the game a long time, it's a occupational hazard. Because I didn't really even drink when I started at the zoo. The zoo only had beer and wine. And I never even I don't think I've ever ordered either one of those. I was just you know diet coke. I lived in Mountain View, so I had to drive home every night from. from oh, dude. From the zoo. I lived in that, San- <laughs> eventually I moved up there but like the first year or two I was driving back and forth so I really didn't start I wasn't a drinker I was more of a pot guy but I didn't I didn't start really drinking until I was like house MC at Cobbs and the, the this the John Stout Scott they would make me these pint glass margaritas I'm house MC so I'm there all night drinking these and I just over the years yeah. you're only one of your only benefits at a club you go it's like oh you get free drink you know some at some places and if you're so fat over, fuck like me over the years my tolerance Absolutely. just just grew and then i lived, moved to new york and it was a, that's all this is such a drinking town you know dude so I just decided to just give it a stop for a while i know and then sometimes people judge you if you go out with comics and you're not partying with everybody and they're like oh, yeah, well you're too good for everybody what it's like no dude i I'm, I'm about to have a heart attack and then and then let's just like if we go do a bunch of lines it's like a liability like i don't I can't do it right now. It's like it's almost like that's why I'm losing weight so I could do drugs again. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm losing weight so I can gain more weight later. Yeah, so I can, yeah. exactly. You know, it's just like you know, my heart isn't stressed enough right now. I want to stress yeah. it out by losing a ton of weight and then gaining it all back and just you know, fat people rejoicing and yes, you're one of us. Yeah, again. yeah, yeah. I mean, like it's just I don't know. It's just like with people. I don't know. I don't know. I just like you, you, like you said, like you, you always consider yourself a, a fat person. I'm, I'm a like, fat I'm like, guy. That's how I identify. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I just, no, just no, gym, you know? so I'm, I'm sorry about the cult, culture appropriation comment that I, I restrict <laughs> that. I, I, I take that back. I no, because that I was, <laughs> dude, I'm from fat. I have a birth certificate. It says place, place of birth. It just says fat. So I'm from, <laughs> I'm from that place. I grew up, I was a fat kid, fat, fat. So I, you know, that's just drilled in me. I just, I'm never going to be able to, I never was just like, oh, okay, I can have that. I was always like, no, nah, you know, it's always, it's always, my, I fucked up in my head. Dude, oh, I mean, like, at least Titanic didn't come out when you were in middle school. And, you, <laughs> and at least you weren't Hispanic when it came out when you were in middle school. Oh, and yeah. at least no one called you the Hispanic Titanic when you were in fucking middle school. And guess what? I've incorporated that as a joke. And guess what my website is? HispanicTitanic.com. Oh, I, swear no. I, I end my sets with, if you guys like me, check me out at HispanicTitanic.com. People laugh, and I'm like, that's not a joke. That's my actual website. Then people come up with their phones to me after the show. They're like, your website really is HispanicTitanic.com. I'm like, I was not joking. They're like, oh, because people don't believe half my set. People don't believe I'm married. People don't believe that I have sex. And people don't believe that um, I'm a substitute teacher or that I teach kids successfully. And so, I mean, just looking at me. I don't think it's that they don't believe. I think they don't want to believe. Like, that guy's not in front of my kids, I hope. Oh, please. No, Tony. Who's gonna... <laughs> please, it's a joke. Jesus I don't want... Christ. Okay, I need to have you on speed dial on my phone because you know what? Anytime I have an insecure moment, I'm going to call Tony and be like, Victor, this is what's really happening uh, because you are reading this 100% wrong. No, but um, there's like, uh, I was transitioning to, to pot. Uh, are you an indica guy, sativa guy, hybrid guy, or whatever's available? Uh, it sort of depends on the situation. At night, <laughs> I like this at night here. I like I mean, this one. Tony's going to the drawer, pulling out. Are those gel tabs? They're uh... THC CBN. Oh shit, CBN. The N is for nighttime. No, it's not. But um, <laughs> it might, like if THC isn't the high causer. It's uh, that's what I would call THC the high causer. <laughs> oh, that's like so you great. call CBN the sleepy. Uh, Stuff. This stuff is I so I, I indica at night and I sativa during the day. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm just I'm an indica guy all the time because of my chronic pain and depression and like that shit. Like, I don't know about you. I mean, I'm this is not projecting, I'm just speaking for myself. So um, I mean, I get really depressed as fuck and I'll smoke weed and be like <laughs> and just like you know, forget that I was depressed and write stupid jokes. And by stupid jokes, I mean things that are like not c- cerebral, but like more like what I think is funny. And uh-huh. so, like, I don't know, I've had people, like, 
oh, what? You didn't go to college? When's the last time you read a book? And it's just like, dude, don't condescend to the crowd. You know, they're like, you know, some cases it's just like, I, I was opening for John Witherspoon and they were just like, where's Pops? During my set. And I'm just like, that was rude. You know, like, <laughs> it's like, they're not there yeah. for me. So just like, I don't know. Um, so like with, with, with the weed, do you smoke weed before you go on stage or write or do you? I, I really stopped smoking a lot of it. I mean, I have a vape here and stuff because my lung just got, I get really, I'm a cougher. So oh. like, I'm, you know, like a guy will have like some crazy five foot bong or people oh, shit. Have those. Um, and I just, I just cough where it's just not pleasant where I'm just, you know, just cheers are coming out of my, I'm just coughing so much. Oh but my God. You mentioned Tommy Chong and that's, <laughs> no, I was transitioning to it. I was okay. transitioning. Right, never mind. Never mind. No, I, I'm saying that uh, before the conversation that I told you that I was going to bring it up because I was doing research. Uh, because uh, for those of you that don't know, this was great because like the marijuana logs I saw like when I was uh, in college. And so that was fucking amazing. I didn't know that people loved weed like that, you know, in spite of like having seen half baked and it's just like making it stand up, making it funny. Like, how did you guys think of that? Were you guys just like, we should do something, but like, because it's based off the vagina monologues, the, the, the marijuana logs. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 And so, so you guys, were you guys smoking or something? You guys were just like, Hey, we should, we should fucking put this on Broadway. Our, uh, I wish you could just say that and it would happen. I, we should, we should, we should put this on Broadway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. I should have a million bucks. Yeah, um, you're a star. But it's like those little steps, you know, like Arch had, we were doing, I remember we were doing the road gig. We were doing a road gig. Maybe it was a triple or Pat Wilson or something. Uh -huh. We were in Washington state just doing road gigs. And then he had the pun because the vagina monologues were everywhere. And he's like, the marrow monologue. I'm like, that's a good idea. And I was mutual. I had a friend, Doug Benson, who had a different manager. And he was a big pot smoker. He had a lot of pot jokes anyway. So I asked him if he'd want to do it because the, the vagina monologues, I looked at the vagina monologues, it's three people doing a reading of different people's submissions and letters and notes, you know, personal conveyances about how they feel about the, their vaginas and whatnot. <laughs> so I asked, swung it by Doug and he was interested. And then we just like wrote it. We just put it together. And at first it was like 25 minutes and 30 minutes. And then immediately then uh, Doug's manager taped it and sent it to Montreal. So we got Montreal before we finished, before we only had like maybe 30 to 40 minutes and we had to get it to an hour. So we wrote a bunch and then went to Montreal. Holy and then shit. and then we did it on the road a lot. And then when we got the offer for Broadway, we had to do it. We had to think of like a, a, a bigger ending. We had to make it a bigger show. Like we thought Doug and I came up with the ending with playing America's Beauty. It has this music ending and swelling and a, a long speech. So, so we had to get it up. We had to bump it up again to get it to that length. I think it, was, it ended up at being 70 minutes. Dude. You can't change it. Once it goes to like that level, you can't, you can't change it too much. We had fun every night and switched it, but like it's called the yeah. book and you got to stick to the, the book, to the script or whatever in Broadway terms. But yeah, that was, it was, so that's how the, that's how it kind of came about is just through a pun. And then yeah. that would be a good idea. And then also when you have in comedy, if you can niche market, like if you're like a Latino or, you 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 have a certain market built in, and we have that in spades. When you had the marijuana people, you know all kinds of, well, yeah, you know, and there's a lot. You realize there's a lot of different kind of marijuana smokers. Yeah, I mean that's the thing though too. It's just like with uh, doing the research. I just recently um, interviewed Tommy Chong, and then doing research, it's just Tommy Chong was part of the marijuana marijuana logs tour. And according to the Wikipedia and the articles that I've read. Um, they were kind of conflicting. Can you clarify why, or I'm sorry, how did Tommy Chong come about being on your guys' show? And then how did he stop being on that show? Uh, he, he was, he would, he was in, when we first started, he wasn't in jail and he was floated as like getting a celebrity thing. And then we kind of voted that down because we just wanted to keep it ourselves. And then when we were in New York, you know, we were in New York every night, except for we were dark on Mondays, it, you know, and the numbers keep going up and down. You get a bump, you get a review, it goes up, but you gotta get people in that thing every night. And then sometimes two, two shows a night on weekends. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, so you just, you know, you constantly gotta keep people in. So it was, a, it was floated as he was gonna come out of jail. Uh -huh. He was getting released and this would be his first return 
And, you know, it's a relatively easy gig because you're just sitting down reading from a book. You know? <laughs> oh, I, I mean, really, that's, 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 that's why awesome. we did it. And we still screwed it up a lot. <laughs> you know, we had the wrong pages. We <laughs> oh, sorry. I just... to read upside down books. You know, we take pages out of each other's books and stuff. Are you guys fucking with each other like that? That's... Oh, all the time. Oh, we, that's so great. We put like porn on people's binders. So when they lifted it up to read something, there'd be a big giant <laughs> dick there. And <laughs> oh, oh my God. I love it. I fucking love it. That's you're so bored. Funny. As a stand up, you're bored. You're sitting in a stool with this <laughs> script and you're used to having the whole stage, you know? So we're all. <laughs> when, we, when it's the other person's turn, it is a real effort to just sit there and watch them when the spotlight was on him and not fuck around, you know? Oh Arjun and I would fuck around behind Doug's back because he was in the middle. He like. <laughs> We would do hand signs behind his back when the light was on him because no one could see it, but we could see it, uh, you know. So it's little things like that to keep it fun. <laughs> oh my God, that's great. Um, yeah, that's so, so anyway, Tommy was great. We did, he filled in for two weeks um, when Arj was going to Montreal. Uh, and then Brian Posehn was getting married, so we all couldn't go, so I had to stay and those guys went to the wedding. So Tommy Chong filled in. And, uh, and then there was some road gigs after. We did the East Coast, we did these theaters, great theaters. Fun. And then we were going to do a West Coast um, big tour with Tommy Chong. So uh, we fly into Seattle or Vancouver. I think we do a show in Seattle. We do a show in Vancouver. Tommy lives in Vancouver, Canada. He, we go to this house, beautiful house, right on the water, you know, and uh, just beautiful. And then, but people are, are throwing, people are throwing so much marijuana um, in Seattle. People were throwing marijuana on stage, and he's oh, he's, he's not feeling great about it because. You know, it's like, I can't be around marijuana, really. And they're throwing it at me. Oh, my God. I mean, it's a lot. Like, I'm, we're, me and, you know, I'm, I'm cleaning it up. I mean, it's like, you know, this buzz, if you put them together, it's like a, a, a shoebox full of buds. And people don't throw bad marijuana at Tommy Chong. It, it's all crazy good, you know. Yeah. You oh phone, numbers on the, phone numbers on the pie. Hey, Tommy. <laughs> um, oh, my God. That's yeah, so. Yeah, so that's Vancouver. And then we got to take. The producers hired this in their lame, we got the <laughs> biggest, most, the stupidest white stretch limo SUV <laughs> to go from Tommy Chong's house, pick us up at the, we did a show in the Vancouver, uh, in, yeah, in, in Vancouver. Next gig was in Seattle. We get pulled over at the border, dogs, everything, you know? Mm -hmm. And we we dumped out all the pots. We know we're gonna go through the border. But I had a bud that got in my backpack. It was like it went under like a toothpaste thing. It was oh no! But they didn't see it. They didn't find it. We got <laughs> all right. You guys can go. They had a dog under the thing the whole way, and we had to exit the vehicle. And they're you know all right, all right. And Tommy's calling the he's calling the thing because his visa is not a work visa. It's a recreational visa. Whatever. It's a it's a, a travel visa. Right. Yeah. So there is all this faxing back at the time. Faxing lawyer stuff. So we get to Seattle <laughs> and we do a show, same thing, pot thrown on stage, you know, so we're, we're going to hit the tour bus the next day, we're getting on there, getting our little thing the next day to go to Portland. And uh, Tommy's like, I got to quit the show, man, my parole officers, he's just too, I'm just, because all this pot and then the thing at the border was so close, you know, like, and I had, it was my, I had, it was like, it was so close at the border. Jesus. You know, I mean, I, I'm gonna, if I go back, I go back for a long time because it's a parole violation and all this pots being thrown on, thrown up on stage. I just, it's just too hot right now. And, and oh. I thought it would be cool if I, as long as I'm not smoking, I thought it'd be cool. But the guy's like, you're, you're putting yourself, you're surrounding yourself in a marijuana world. And it's not kind of not, you're kind of not being true to your probation spirit. We're getting away from this. You're just like basically owning up to it again. Oh my God. Back at it. So he's like, I just feel uncomfortable. So he left, and then I remember Oregon, like being in Oregon. I was like, "There's no, there's no show in Oregon." All right. Which then they said, "Oh, he's sick. Last minute cancellation due to illness." Oh then my then god! Just, then they just bought his plane tickets home. It was just like we, and then there was now there was all legal wrangling between those guys, you know, because we were out of it. We're like, "All right, whatever," you know. Dude, that's amazing, man. Because like some, like you know, when you hear about like, oh, people collaborating and then they stop collaborating, it's like, oh, something bad happened. Like something. Yeah, definitely, yeah. There was like a like a clash of the egos, or there was like and it wasn't it wasn't even collaboration. Like that, we wrote the show, and he just came later, and he would put he would he he put one or one or two of his own stories in there, and they were great. 
But it was it was our show that he was filling because people say Tommy Chong's marijuana, you know, once. once oh, he joined, yeah. Yes, absolutely. That, once that... he joined, it was interesting because once he joined, our names just disappeared, which is fine. We didn't care. But it was like Tommy Chong's marijuana logs. And um, oh my God, uh, oh, you're frozen again. Are you serious? I'm going to wait. Wait, there's either no that way. or you fell asleep. No, no, um, I did not fall asleep. No, no. everything. The, the, oh, no. Now you story. froze. Wake up. Now you froze. No, come can on, you hear me? On, Victor. I know you could wake up. Can you hear me? Come on. Ah, shit. I think we're going to have to record a second part. Wait, can you hear me? Fuck. All right. Well, Jesus. Okay. Hey, I'm going to stop recording. Fuck. Fuck. Tony, where you at? Damn, I... Technical difficulties. <laughs> this is hilarious. Tony, Tony's frozen right here. <laughs> it's not me because my computer's still working, but I'm going to, I'm going to stop it right now. Uh, Tony's supposedly still in the chat. So I don't know what the fuck's going on. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, okay. Now he's not here. Okay. So <laughs> at any rate, um, I don't know whether to, Cut it or not, we're probably not going to cut it. No, we're not going to cut it. We're good. I'm going to message him right now on his phone to let him know that I'm still in here um, and still recording. Oh, no, wait, he's back. He's back. I didn't stop recording. I knew it. And I just got my phone because I was going to message you, Tony. Dude, oh, my God. And because I was like, okay, well, he froze. He's gone, folks. I'm just going to message him. Let I him know that I'm still you here. Froze. No, I didn't freeze. You froze. Because uh -huh. of my phone. I'll tell Honestly. you something. Oh, oh, that's our first fight. Hey, I knew it was going to come. Get the fuck out of here. All right. No, I'm just kidding. I think I'm a reincarnated um, New Yorker because sometimes when I take LSD and people ask me how I'm doing, I'm like, oh, I'm doing fantastic. I'm doing marvelous, marvelous. And it's just like. Yeah, that does sound like it's, you're channeling some. When I take, How often do you take LSD? A lot? Uh, well, let's put it like this. Um, people usually like buy a couple of squares at a time. I buy a couple of vials. So okay. each, each vial has like 100 hits of LSD. And so I accidentally bought two vials of acid uh, before the pandemic happened. And then the pandemic happened, everything closed down. And so I had to do puppet shows on Instagram Live where I'm high on LSD and fucking Ron from the punchline is watching me. David Williams from the San Jose Improv is watching me. My mom was watching me and I'm like, fuck. And I told her not to come to my show. I'm like, don't. Log on on Fridays at 9 p.m., please. I'm going live. I don't want you to see me. I'm going to be extremely fucked up. Just please don't watch it. It's going to break your heart. Just don't watch it, please. And then she's in there, and I'm like, so at any rate, so it's just like, ah, uh, it was it was a lot you of. You probably have a good relationship with your mom. You probably, she knows you better. Well, I mean, I slipped, and I came out of the LSD closet. And like, you know, like, you know, there's, oh, I came out of the closet. I, I told everybody, no, I came out of the LSD closet with my mom. And she's like, mijo, why would you do that? I'm like, oh, shit. Uh, because it's for my mental health. And um, instead of using uh, depression medication, I like to use uh, LSD because I, I channel, like, I, I get connected with the world better and I understand my place in the world and I feel less sad, or at least I convince myself that I'm less sad. So that's why, like, I am a huge LSD psychedelic enthusiast, you know, for to battle depression, loneliness, and other diseases or not, illnesses, I should say, not diseases. It's like, and she, she bought it? She bought it. She, uh, <laughs> not really. It was like the first time she discovered I was smoking weed and I don't know. It's just like I'm my mom use that. It's because I can connect better with the world in the mumbo jumbo. Jumbo <laughs> pudding. Say a bunch of things and mama. All right, all right. Mama say mama laka, mama musa. That's that good. Right. That's, that's uh... But I swear to God, I mean it though. Everything I just said about LSD and psychedelics is just like really something that like I stand by because like I want people to you know find their inner truth and sometimes the inner truth is being withheld it's so okay so i'm recording this and you guys can see that co <laughs> that tony just froze and uh but it's funny like but <laughs> for those of you that are listening but um i'm gonna just wait for tony he'll be back but yeah um as mentioned before lsd wonder drug don't recommend it if you're in a bad place you should not ever take lsd if you're in a bad place um, because what will happen is, um, um, sorry, I'm trying to message, uh, Tony right now to come back. Okay. Now he's gone. Okay. 
uh, I want him to come back. This is hilarious because like these technical difficulties are just like, okay, either roll with the punches or not. Thank God it's not happening on my end because if it was happening on my end, like it would be like all this shit would just stop recording because my computer stopped. So it's, this is, this is great. But, um, yeah, um, I didn't want to stop talking about LSD, even though Tony isn't here. And I was just like, what'd you say? It's like, what, what were we talking about when you were gone? Well, you know, I was just talking about all this. stuff, And I had some more questions uh, for Tony uh, that I wanted him to answer. So we're either going to splice this together or something. But no, I'm not going to stop recording. Uh, I'm just going to keep talking about, you know, adventures that you take, you know. And I think everybody should take some type of adventure uh, mentally uh, in order to feel better physically. And I mean that because sometimes you're able to connect with the world uh, with chemicals that you normally wouldn't a be able to. So I wanted to ask Tony about another appearance that he made on television because, you know, Tony's fucking hilarious. And so, like, it's just so funny talking to him because it's just like, you know, I want to really get some more information like, ah, oh, this behind this behind the, the scenes stuff is so brilliant because like even the Tommy Chong stuff is like, I told him I wanted to talk to him about it before the podcast. And so I didn't, I don't think he knew that was transitioning, which is cool because like sometimes I take a while to transition. Sometimes I just uh, like transition. Oh, there's one word that I'm going to use in what, in my statement I, I'm about to say. So let me transitioning, transition it using, using that one word. So that doesn't always work out, but you know, you got to be able to just go with the flow. It's just like when you're doing stand up and like somebody drops a plate and the plate breaks into a million pieces and it's the loudest thing you've ever heard in your life. You don't just keep going on with your material. You acknowledge what's happening. Let everybody know, hey, this was not as planned. So let me just be in the moment and talk about what's really going on now. I think right now I would be screwed if I was void of a personality. Like I'd be like, oh, oh, <laughs> but like I'm more than just a beard. I am. Um, <laughs> I have feelings. No, I'm just kidding. I don't. Uh, but it, it's pretty cool talking to Tony and talking about how the how his experience. And, you know, I was going to ask about just for laughs. And then like I got brought up organically with the marijuana log. And, you know, it's funny because like I started off asking like, so what's up? Where you're like, hey, we should make this into a Broadway show. And it's just like, no, this is the evolution, how it came about from a thought, writing into a book, reading that on stage, making that into a Broadway play, making that longer. It's just like, dude, that is one hell of a process. You know, people think that we go on stage and we just wing it. We don't. Um, and, you know, with the marijuana logs, like that was a book that was written by a few authors and was presented on stage as a play and that's pretty fucking cool you know that's pr that's pretty cool like getting organic ideas to be able to produce cool stuff cool content is part of the game you know and it sucks because like it is hard to create new things because also when you're creating new content especially in comedy there's a good chance you're going to look like an idiot so people are scared to take chances because they're scared to fail and when you're a comedian you take chances and you might fail and look foolish on top of failing it's just like how more humiliating could this whole thing get you know i failed and now i'm humiliating myself by saying really careless things on stage that aren't maybe all the way hashed out or thought out or maybe it's just like a half-baked idea because sometimes you're writing on stage i was going to ask tony about writing on stage versus writing beforehand traditionally because there's differences between you know every every comic and every person is different with the way that we write on stage if you decide to write on stage sometimes you don't write on stage until you're getting heckled and then you come through with um, things to say to the heckler. And then that turns into good content right there when you're riffing. And so Tony is back with the vengeance and I've been carrying the conversation by myself, like a lunatic, hoping that you'd come back. You don't um, even need me really. <laughs> I need you, baby, dude. I, I need you on this episode and I need you to my life. This is so hysterical. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, remember what you apologize. No, no, no. Trust me. This is this is great. And I was explaining. I'm glad it's happening on your end and not on my end. Because if it was happening on my end, then it would be like boop, disconnected, not recording anymore. Save, 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 save. I can't even access my Zoom until it's done saving. Like, you know, and then I freaked out because some of my interviews are like 
two hours and five minutes, one hour and 50 minutes, an hour and a half, an hour and five minutes. So I'm just like, and it's like, it's only one little like, oh, cancel. It's only one thing. Do you want to cancel this or no? It's just like, why the fuck would you do that? It's, I don't want to cancel this at all. No, and then, no, so no, I don't no. press anything. And I almost canceled the Tommy Chong one. Uh, I so- bought, like, I don't know. My wife does it eight hours a day. I don't know. And she never, I don't know why I'm. <laughs> she probably put like a timer like, hey, you can't. She, she, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <I don't laughs> no, but dude, no, you're coming out with these gems with. Uh, and I was explaining like the behind the curtains and like how we don't just wing it when we go on stage. You know, people think that we wing it going on stage. It's like this is years of practice. And so um, well, there's always a there's always a um, and de- it depends on the performer. I'd say some people like Jake Johansson or some people, they're almost 100 percent unwinged. And I'm I'm a, on a good night. I'm maybe a 60, 40, you know, 70, 30 wingness. And it also I, I travel a lot for I was a feature act for friends who are headlining. So I don't do a lot of crowd work or winging it because it's they don't you know, they don't like to get to crowd too talkative but i love to do it you know i, I really when i headline it's probably a lot too a lot of crowd work and so so so, so that's what i think of the loosey-goosey part you know but you got to have a you got to have a foundation right the pre-written work so that that was one of my questions i wanted to ask you um what what is your like writing process on stage versus beforehand do you write on stage or are you like Nope, I have to have this like pre-written because I was explaining while you were gone that sometimes you like are writing when like on stage you don't even know you're writing when you're dealing with a heckler. Because like oh, that's much- why I froze. That's why I froze the thing as I was I was writing down what I should say next question, but I did I wanted to freeze it <laughs> so you wouldn't have to hear me <laughs> write out my answers. You know. I wanted, um, to, I wanted to be real articulate with them. Oh my god! Yeah, no, I was just like. Uh, because like, I don't know, with the whole writing on stage thing, like, do you, do you do it? Do you prefer to like, just have your stuff? Like, I don't know. Uh, I'm a horrible writer, but I, yeah, I write, I write them down the gist of it. And then I try to work it out on stage. You know, like I really come back from the road. That's where I write is, is the experience of being on stage. You know, I, I'll get something close and then really figure it out when you're up there, you know, like, especially like a good crowd. They could really write jokes for you. They could really, yeah. they could really help you of like, you know, feel something out. Yeah. No, well, I mean, with um, uh, featuring and opening versus headlining, they're like all different jobs that require like different skill sets. And it's funny because, like, for me, hosting is way fucking harder than featuring. Oh, that's that. I would say that's without saying across the board because <laughs> you you've already got um, you know you got the cold crowd. It doesn't even some of them don't don't want to be there for whatever reason. Yeah. Someone's like, oh, what is this? <laughs> you got to train them to laugh. You got to train them sort of like, here's what's going on. No, a good MC. I was a house MC at college for a year. I still MC stuff. And I, when you, when you have that good relationship with the crowd, it's fun because you go back up and you flirt with them again. They, they have like one personality and you have, and it's a good thing on a good night, you know, like, uh, so I used to love hosting, but it's, yeah, it's a different, you, you know, like someone goes up and they bomb, you got to bring the energy back. Someone, someone goes long. All right, let's bring the next person. You, you know, there's a lot because sometimes MCs run the show. Sometimes they're in charge of the light. Sometimes they're, you know, they're, there's, that's the biggest job. And someone, what is Kevin Rooney or someone said, what, if you're an MC in comedy, you never stop being MC, whether you're MCing the Oscars or you're wearing, you're, you're always going to, you can, they always want a funny MC. You know, that's, that skill will never leave you. Um, and it's, it's, it's very different than being funny, but fun, being funny is part of being a good, MC, if that makes any sense. You know? No, that totally makes sense because it's like, I've gotten compliments like, oh, we weren't expecting the host to be funny. And I'm like, what the fuck is that supposed to mean? But then at the same time, it was just me being insecure because I was like, are you guys backhandedly telling me how a shitty set? Yeah, they're yeah, like, yeah. And then they're like, no, you actually had a good set. You surprised us. I was like, oh, okay. It's like, because we haven't heard from you. We haven't heard of who you are. I was like, oh, yeah, or, okay. or people don't have high expectations for the first two acts or whatever, or, or first uh, act or less, you know? And then like, I've been on shows where it's just like me and the host, or I'm sorry, me and the feature do better than the headliner. And then like, you know, the audience that came out for the headliner is like, what the fuck is all that? And I'm like, yeah. I don't fucking know. You fuck. It's like, hey, you're you're their opener. Like, talk to them. And it's just like, well, I don't really tour with them or know them like that. You know what I mean? And so I can't yeah. just go. Like, I had somebody come up to me, like, uh, during, like who I know from the hood for back in the day. They came to support me when I was at the San Jose Improv. And they, I'm not gonna say who, but they're like, hey, bro, is the headliner your your homie? 
I was like, I know him. Yeah. They're like, bro, can you tell him that I've seen him like 20 times and I've seen him do the same shit every motherfucking time? Did you tell him to change up his shit? I'm like, no, but you can. <laughs> because you just paid to fucking be here. You just yeah. paid the two drink minimum. You just did all this stuff to be here. So why don't you tell him? Because if I tell him, it's gonna make it's gonna seem like I'm an asshole. Like, oh yeah, so, my people yeah, you're you're a bitch if you tell him. I'm a bitch. You're a, hey, you're, a you're a disgruntled customer if you're you saying it. Right. I mean, so, he, yeah. he, so it's just like so I wasn't trying to like call shame or whatever because it's just like you have your club set. You do your club set because you know that's what's gonna work. And it's just so um. I don't know, like with stand up, there comes like a lot of things having to do with like mental health and so being sad. And so I was just wondering, um, mental health being important in every uh, profession, but it seems like stand up thrives off of misery and conflict. What are your thoughts about mental health and comedians? Well, that's a that's a complex situation. I have comedy writer friends who have, you know, real bad depression. You know, it's like attempted suicide attempts and uh I'm, I'm i don't really have that i would get the i get down like everybody um but not i don't really have you know to my some, some people in the outer edge of my family have real bad depression i i just think it's the worst i i mean i've seen it but i don't really have it i'm thankful because like i said i i came into it, i was a chubby kid you know and that humor that's how i got my humor is a defense mechanism you know mm -hmm. but uh it's I, yeah, I thankfully I'd be a lot funnier, I think, if maybe an uncle touched me or I had depression. Ha! Ha! I told I my brother I'd be, that. I'd be certainly a theater headliner if I had some depression issues, but oh I really god. don't. Oh my god, that's so fucked up. Oh Jesus Christ. I was just like, I need Tony to come here and give me some gold, and you did not disappoint. Um, so I really <laughs> no, I, I told my brother that. I was just like, Yeah, where was my Theo Chucho at? The fucker, the selfish fucker? What the fuck? <laughs> No, I'm just kidding, though. But I'm like, really, like, uh, I guess uh, I got diddled. But at least it was like I was eight and she was 12 and it was a she. So, that yeah. was, you know, so that wasn't like I didn't feel like I got diddled. That's no. probably healthy, bro. That's healthy, bro. You That's were getting, healthy, bro. You were getting some high now. That's just an early high? start, okay, bro? <laughs> oh, my God. It's so funny. Um, <laughs> Tony's my Mexican friend. Um, it's I'm actually 60% um, Mexican. Really? I thought, yeah. I, th I thought you were Italian. Yeah, we did, we did too until we got our DNA done. Am I, what? It was a, a Mexican got in there somewhere. What? Well, 60%, that's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. I think I'm someone, like, was, I'm, lying. I'm, someone I'm, was lying. <laughs> we, had some, we had some lie in our past. It's Italian and French, but now it's uh, Italian and Mexican. Well, Mexicans are like French. I mean, we kicked them out of Mexico. Uh, yeah, you kicked everybody out of me. You kicked the well, Spanish out. We mainly. kicked the Spanish out. We kicked the French out when Napoleon tried to take over. Uh, yeah. that Cinco de Mayo versus it's Mexican independence, which is from Spain. September, right? Yeah, September, September, September 16th. Yeah. I'm doing a show that night, Friday the 8th. I'm just kidding. I'm not promoting my show on my podcast. <laughs> I mean, I would if I was on somebody else's podcast, but it's just like, is it a, is it an independence day show? It's a, Latino themed comedy show at the Ha Ha Comedy Club in North Hollywood. And I had to ask the dude, I was like, is it in English or in Spanish? <laughs> and he's like, it's in English. And I'm like, is that Jack? It's Jack. And like, I've been hitting him up for a while now. And I'm like, dude, here's different videos of me doing different jokes. Like, here's a 17 minute one. Here's a 15 minute You wanted minute. to see like a lot of different stuff? No, I just, I'm a hell in security. He fucking responded to the first one or the second oh. one. So I'm sending him different shit. And I'm like, hey, look, here's Huntington Beach. Hey, look, here's Long Beach. Hey, look, here's the San Francisco punchline. Hey, look, here's Don't Tell Comedy. Hey, look, it's just like, this is an all Latino audience. This is an all white audience. And this just is a think mixed of audience. all this work just to get a set at the ha ha. Just to get a set that's at the a, ha ha. That's, <laughs> that's, that's a state of stand up comedy in 2020, in 2022. Tony, Tony. You do all that work just to get into the goddamn ha ha. I told I told Tony before we started recording, I was like, this isn't a I got you moment. And this fucker right here is like, I got you, motherfucker. Well, I didn't get you. <laughs> no, I'm getting jacked by Jack. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not getting jacked. We'll see. We'll see. I'm Jack I'm, and Jack. I'm Jack and Jack on the most Jack of days. No, I'm just I kidding. Like Jack. Jack's great. He's actually a pretty fun guy. It was funny, though, because like I, I went to go meet up with, with uh, Pablo because we're discussing a project we're working on. And he um, was like, hey, what are you doing tonight? I was like, uh, he invited me to the supernova show but then i guess it was like it got transferred to the haha -ha, and like bill burr 
And oh yeah, uh, that was a crazy show. I and, saw that lineup. And Jim Jeffries was there. And I got there while Bill Burr was on stage. And I was like, as soon as you walk into the main room, I was standing by that doorway. And then Jack's like, can you please stand on the other side over there by the green room? And I was just like, no problem. So I just skedaddled over to the other side and lo and behold, like, dude, that was a killer lineup, bro. It was oh, yeah, like super killer. Yeah. It was like, uh, and it was You're like, am I at the ha ha? <laughs> no, it was, it was hysterical too, because like, I was just like, Pablo was like, Hey bro, I'm going to put you on the list, dude. I'm gonna put you on the list. Don't worry about it, bro. So I walk up in there and I'm like, yeah, I'm meeting up with Pablo. He's, he's going to put me on the list. They're like, which Pablo? And I'm like, God damn it. Um, hey, you know, <laughs> I was like, what do you mean, which Pablo? Yeah. Pablo Escobar. Like, and as I almost fucked up and called him that one time when I was like, yeah, give it up for, I was like, let it, I was like, give it up for your headliner, Pablo Francisco. Let you him take it as a compliment, you. probably. Oh, man. No, it's so funny, though, man, because I'll talk to him and he will start doing impressions of Scarface as Kermit the Frog. And it is the funniest fucking thing. He's like, OK, man, well, you got to get the drugs to Sosa, man. And it's just, it's just the funniest fucking thing. Because it's like it's 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 like <laughs> I'm like, dude, like, ah, I just can't believe like he's always on. Yeah, yeah. Always on. Like, it's like my wife came up to me. She was like, shh. Like when I'm on, when I'm talking on the phone, I'm like, what the fuck? I'm on the phone. I get off the phone. And she's like, is he really that funny? I'm like, yeah. Sometimes I have to take anxiety medicine when I'm talking. To yeah, him. yeah. And it's just like, and it's not him. I love him. It's just like I'm just like, fuck, dude. Like I'm fucking, like you know, like really like amped up by like a lot of the stuff that he says and like. I'm a was- sucker for a good impression too. If someone does a really good, you know, like whatever impressions <laughs> they they do impression for me. I I I love them. I think they're fun. Oh, dude. Yeah, man. He was just really sweet, and he told me in the nicest way, like, hey, hey, bro. You're on my foot. No. <laughs> no he said uh, <laughs> no no I don't, i've never no i would never i'm very careful about that type of stuff i'm too fat to not be careful about that stuff but no he told me in, in very kind words hey dude very funny stuff a little too many fucks but fucks good just a little bit too many fucks and it was just like the nicest sweetest hardest thing and i was like you know because he could have been a dick and be like hey bro if you want if you want to work with me again like you know you got to cut this shit yeah, out yeah, yeah. he could have been a dick about it but I, I took that and i was just i thanked him and he noticed it. He's like, bro, he didn't say fuck as much. And I was like, yeah, I know. My livelihood is based on whether yeah. or not, you know, I take your professional advice or not. He's if I don't yeah, take but a lot of, with- but you, that's a good point, Victor, because a lot of guys don't. They're just stay digging hard. Like no one's going to tell, you know, there's that attitude. No one, no one tells me about my, act, but like, you're smart because this guy has experience. He's been around. He's seen a lot of comedy. He's just saying, Hey, good. I like what you're doing. My, it's always the person's opinion. I think you're just saying, fuck, you, you know, you got to, yeah. who's saying it and what are they saying in context, you know? But I, I think you're, you're smart to like, oh, if I, I, this guy's big, we have a good relationship. I'm not going to screw it up by, by doing something that displeases him. Right. But then also though, too, man, it's like, I want him to fucking, I mean, what I responded was, he's like, a little bit too many fucks. A fuck, a fuck is good, but too many fucks. And then I said, Pablo, dude, I'm fucking nervous, dude. I'm opening for Pablo Francisco. My bad. I'm sorry. Like, and like, I'm not making excuses, dude. I'm, I'm fucking nervous right now. Even you talking, dude, dude, no, dude, you did good. <laughs> you did good. No one's saying you didn't do good. I'm just saying that too many fucks. Okay. You hear Dustin out there. You hear him saying fuck. That's why he worked. And I was just like, 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 I was just like, like he wasn't comparing, but he was just like, you don't have to say fuck to be funny. And he's right. He's right. He doesn't say fuck unless like, I mean, but then again, it's just like, then there's an argument like how you were saying it's just like, oh, well, I'm not going to listen to them. What do they know? And it's just like, I, but, but yeah, dude, like he's been in the business for a really long time. And, you know, I take advice from people all the time, you know, like if, especially if, like you're a veteran, like, you know, like I'm, I give advice to people that have been doing comedy for three or four or five years and they take it and they're like, dude, or like a tag, more like a tag. I give people more tags than I do. You know, like this guy was talking about, like, there's so many go, there's so many ghosts in his family. And I was like, you need to have a cousin named Casper <laughs> in that joke. And he's like, that's fucking funny. He did it right then and there, like the next day after I told him, he's like, dude, you were right. That shit is hysterical. And I was like, yeah, bro, no, just use it. That was yours. He's like, are you sure? I was like, I don't talk about being Mexican like that. I just mentioned it like, you know, in passing. Yeah, yeah. And but like I don't be like, oh yeah. And then my mom, when we grow up, she used to hit me with the chancla and it was like fucked up, bro. But she leave like a mark and it's like, hey, not the face, not the face. Like, you know, it's just like it's already been fucking done. It's already yeah, been yeah, like yeah. like so it's just like I don't know. I'm just trying to do like what I think is funny. 
or like, you know, talking about almost getting fired from a comedy show for telling a story about choking out my wife during sex that somebody did not believe that somebody thought I was making up that like somebody as grotesque and as fat and as ugly as me could never fucking have a woman say, hey, I need you to choke me out right now during sex. So that was her. And she said in the email, she said that Victor makes up all this stuff. Victor, why are you giving Victor a platform to speak his misogyny against women? And that's just like, dude, this is my life. This is my, yeah, exactly. I'm just reporting incidences. And yeah, like, I, get, I used to get that. I get hissed. I had, I had, two, <laughs> I, had, I had two, I would get, I had two girlfriends who, who changed teams later after I dated them. I do a joke <laughs> about it and people like would boo, like, dude, how do you think I felt? <laughs> my dad said, I already have in a bad situation and you're booing me. <laughs> go with them. You know, it's like I'm the butt of this joke and you're shitting on me. Uh, Look at people, Tony. Huh? Dude, Tony has suffered enough. Fuck thank you, you, Victor. You understand. Dude, if any of you if any of these hissers are listening right now, fuck you. Yo, Tony, an apology. That's fucked thank you. up. They don't Jesus. owe me an apology. Just stop it. I've okay. just been <laughs> my life. It's it's <sighs> worse than doing a bad joke because you're booing my actual existence. Dude, again. Like, I know it's shitty. That's why I'm sharing it. Yeah, so people could stop thinking about their shittiness, concentrate yes. on your shittiness. Have yeah, a good okay. fucking time. Thank you. Jesus. Take a break. Listen to what happened to me. You got it good, you know? Take yeah. It Take it in that spirit. Yeah. Did you ever turn two ladies lesbians? No. No. Maybe I they did. Because they were ladies. That'd but... be that'd be a feather in your cap. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, you brought someone to the, the hetero side, you know, but it's just like, yeah. I don't know. That's like, that's a touchy subject. And then even if it happened, it's your truth. It's like, I've, I don't know. It's just like I, I've had the only people that have a problem with me referring to myself as a thick spick named Vic has always been white people. I've never had like any Mexican be like, hey, bro, I'm going to fucking cancel you for calling yourself a thick spick named Vic, bro. That's not funny, man. You know, you're really putting our fucking culture back 30 years by talking like that, bro. Like, you know, like that shit doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. I never get that fucking thing. It's Salinas, you know, Salas. They're like, yeah, fuck. Yeah, yeah. they're like, fuck your dreams and aspirations. Make us laugh, puta. And so, like, that, <laughs> that was the first time I got a fucking standing O was in fucking wow. Salinas, bro. I mean, what, the only places I ever got standing O's have been in front of fucking Mexicans. I'm not going to lie. And um, it was pretty fucking really, like, one of the highlights of my life, like, even to this day. And that was, like, in, like, 2016 or 2017. But, like, um, you know, I prefer any audience. Like, I've just started getting into Spanish comedy where I do comedy in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And that's a different ballpark entirely, like entirely. I talked to a Mexican comedian. I'm sorry. I talked to a Spanish speaking comedian who happens to be Mexican. And like, I got his number and he was kind of pissed that I got his number. And he was like, Hey bro, I can only talk to you for three minutes. I was like, okay, yeah, no problem. I'm really serious about starting a Spanish comedy community in the Bay area. Oh, what? And I started talking to him for like an hour and a half. And then like, so he's telling me like pretty much like how to do comedy in Spanish. And so like in Spanish, there's no cancer jokes. In Spanish, there's no pedophile jokes. And cancer, I mean, in Spanish, there's no uh, cancer jokes or any of these like really Wait a minute, like, is there no cancer in Spanish? No, there's definitely cancer in Spanish. Oh, but I was you gonna don't, say, but I'm you gonna be Spanish. Oh, and then, and then he told me, you can't joke about rape unless it's in prison. And you're saying that you're gonna rape another guy. And I'm like, what? <laughs> That's this weird. But, but I, was he, is he from Spain? Mexico. No, but oh. I, I have this joke in Spanish about how, and I call out Mexicans. You know, I was like, we have any Mexicans in the crowd? They're like, woo, you guys are a bunch of fucking hypocrites. You know that, right? Because like, you guys are so homophobic and hate. And this is all in Spanish. So you guys fucking say, if I have a gay son, I would never allow him in my house. Such a disgrace. You know, I hate gay people. That's such a sin. That's an abomination against God. But you know what? These same fuckers get drunk as fuck and will tell you, hey, if you don't let me touch your dick, you're gay. Like, I swear to God, that's happened to me multiple ah. times in multiple different Mexican fucking circles. You don't let me touch your dick, you're gay. That's a that's a loaded statement there, huh? Dude, it's loaded on many fronts. And wow. it is really like, okay, it's like, okay, there's like hyper masculinity and, and, and toxic masculinity. And that was just gay. Like, really, like, and I don't have a problem with gay people. If you're gay, live your life. But don't fucking get drunk. And then try to see my dick. And then, like, I don't take out my dick for fresh air. 
I think I'm wait a minute. Were you wearing a were, were you wearing a cure shirt though? <laughs> I was wearing no shirt whatsoever. Okay. Oh, so all right. I think that's why I was like, you know, it really sig- keep them away. I yeah, you know, mixed signals. It should, but I guess it really invites the people that deserve to be there. But I didn't know I was deserving. Anyway, yeah. you know, that's what that's the ugly uh, ugly duckling sig- syndrome like me. But anyway, no. Uh, so um, I want I I. I, I <laughs> I asked Tony before the interview if I could talk about this because I didn't want to bombard him with something. So in doing the research for this show, I am looking up Tony everywhere. I want to know everything about Tony. I want to know how big his wiener is. And we're going to discuss that right now. No, no, I'm just kidding. So um, You don't to- want to touch it. You're gay. <laughs> Call That's back. A fact. That's a fact. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I like that character. I like the dumb New York character you do. I like him. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you don't he's... touch it. You're gay. Oh yeah, get the fuck that's out of here. That's what the doctor, my doctor, told me that. Your doctor. Um, yeah, no, but dude, uh, so I'm watching a whole episode of Tough Crowd with Colin Quinn, and I see the one and only Tony Kameen right there, and Patrice O'Neill was kind of talking a lot during that episode. He wasn't really giving a lot of people a chance to talk. Like the only times people talk was when people shouted over him and you didn't shout over him. You got called out by Colin saying that you were kind of quiet. And then you said something to the effect of like, hey, um, you know, it's kind of hard to understand what you're saying. And, you know, instead of taking it in jest, Colin Quinn gets in your face, like within like, it looks like an inch within your face and says, oh, oh yeah, yeah, well, well, let me tell you something. Uh, well, uh, unlike, unlike, unlike you and your alternative comedian friends, the reason why I can't pronounce words is because I have new jokes coming into my mind. That, and I'm just like, holy shit, that was not rehearsed. That was not rehearsed. That was wow. That, that like, it was like, like, and I've seen moments like this at comedy shows where it's like, okay, it is no longer funny because it has just crossed a certain line. And it was like. You said it in jest. It was a total fucking joke, and he overreacted. How did you feel when he was like in your? Am I exaggerating, or was he like? No, no. I I thought it was all in the in fun because I knew him. You know, I I I knew Colin. Like, so that wasn't the first time you met him, right? No, no, no. Okay, okay. And and he's gruff, so I just think he's being gruff. But (laughs) the best part is at the very end of the show, he fucked up a word, and I just go see. And he laughed. He laughed. He, he laughed at it. Like if you, I don't know if it's on the thing, but at the very end, we're doing credits. He says something. And he gets it wrong. I'm like, see, because like, I I've been watching all week. We were in New York with the marijuana log, so I was I was watching the show all week. I'm like, he really he really speaks. He really mar- he has a little marble mouth, you know. So yeah. Oh my god, dude, I was fucking dying though. I was dying watching this, and I'm like, oh god. Oh, oh God! Please let me talk about this because, like, oh yeah. So when they is... when they got up and started standing around, that was <laughs> Colin put a hit out on me. That's called like a hit where they don't they ignore they ignored me. So I, that was like a little bit they were doing. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. That... Patrice oh. and uh, Kelly and I think it was Do- I don't know if it was who's Do Do. Or Don- or I, don't I think it was yeah, Dav Donovan. Yeah, whatever yeah, the yeah, other guy. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember exactly, but it was like some. Um, like, like, I, I, it was fine. I, I had fun doing it. There was, I, <laughs> stuck my, I thought I stuck to my guns at least. Dude, you totally did. And I was just watching it. I was just, dude, but the way he got in your face yeah, yeah. was like, I was like, that was not scripted. That was like a legitimate, like, I'm having a breaking point almost. Like, stop. Fucking yeah, yeah. But I, I was stop like, fucking- also, like, I had friends on the show. Lori Kill Martin was working there, Bruce Cherry. So I, I felt it was just part of the show. I never, I never really felt like, oh shit, you know? Oh, if okay. I was maybe if I was a couple years in, I didn't know him. I'd probably be shit my pants. But I like, ah, oh, it's you know, it's just a show. I was just looking at it and I was just like, dude, that was not fake. Like, no, I don't, it wasn't sh- fake. It wasn't I, fake. I, no, because the way that, uh, that he was, like, let, let me tell you something. I like you when you and you, and I was like, okay, okay, throw Tony under the bus. Don't throw his friends under the bus right yeah. now. Throw Tony specifically under the bus right now. Throw him under the bus. Don't don't bring down all. You know what I mean? Because yeah, like, I think he. I was I did some shows opening for Gene Garofalo, so I think he put me in this camp uh, of, uh, of like those kind. And Doug Benson, you know, I was I was in yeah. here, so I think he put me in this camp of which I was fine with. That was the people I hung out with, but I thought I, I didn't take it very seriously. You know, everybody loved Colin even after that, and you know, yeah, because I was watching that, I was like, holy shit. 
that was that was dude like that was unscripted television right there and i was just like i don't know if it's the comic in me that just knew that was fucking real as shit yeah like, it was real but i, I kind of uh, liked it because it stood out i just didn't want to be i was being boring and then by the end at least it wasn't boring you know you were not boring 100 percent of fucking all your engagements were like very very entertaining yeah. unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately for that episode it was there was a lot of well, I mean, fortunately and unfortunately, because, you know, Patrice is gone, so we got some of his wisdom. But, I mean, yeah, let, I, let, let, let other people talk a little bit. All due respect, you know, it's just like, so. I'm yeah, a I, went to work, I went on to work on that show that he, Web Jump. That yeah, he, Web Jump 20. Yeah, uh, I, he wasn't, the, he left, though. But I, I worked on that show right after he left. I'm like, you fire him and I'll work on that show. <laughs> <laughs> no, Patrice uh, was great, because I like crowd work. And, I, you know, he's one of my, he was, he was great. He was funny. He's good. Do you, have any, do you have any of the Patrice stories that come to mind or, or like anything like that? Uh, just that of? one. And then he, his man, he, for a while he was being managed by this guy who ran temporarily ran uh, the New York comedy club. who was a little shifty and, uh, but he was, he was, he was just on every night. It was Patrice's hangout, you know, but it's so funny cause he wouldn't want, he would just go do a set and then we'd go hang out in his Escalade or whatever it was type of thing. It was parked right outside. And just you just see him eating dinner. Mm -hmm. He orders spaghetti, eat dinner. And I was hosting, so I knock on his thing, and he come out right before, go up, do a set, go right back to his Escalade, watch the game, like that. This guy's got it made, man. This guy's got it. Dude, got his little office right there, parked outside of the club. So that's not really a good story. But um, no, <laughs> no this is the second time I hear somebody talking about Escalade today, or yeah, mentioned uh, it. Actually, I was the first talking earlier about like how these guys these attacks for og kush or like these persian guys they pick you up for the escalator and be like you got the og kush baby it's 80 dollars it's 80 dollars baby og kush baby is the best kush baby and so like i don't know i was just like wondering because like that's your dealer no no that was my uh pacific palisade friend who was my roommate in college who was brett and his like family owns like half the city of lodi and like he's super rich and he got pissed off that I broke a six hundred dollar bong. And I'm like, you're rich as fuck. Just charge it on your parents account. Who gives a fuck? Hold on a second. Half the city. of. Ooh. Hold on. Just one. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, Half... I got I got thirty eight bucks. That should be for the whole city of Lodi. <laughs> For those of you that are listening audioly, um, Tony just took out his wallet to count how much money he had. 38 bucks. 38. That buys all of Lodi. <laughs> okay. Well, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> this was uh, obviously before the pandemic. Um, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> oh, my God. I think you're thinking of Modesto. I'm just kidding. Same shit. I know. Um, Modesto's $16. <laughs> yeah, don't forget. Wait a minute. Let's, no, Modesto check. is, um, that's Chris. Chris is Chris Chai Chai got that locked up, right? Dude, I think we're both wrong. I think the correct answer is an eight ball of crystal meth. Yeah, um, <laughs> you got that. that's the right uh, answer. Da -da -da -da. That's the right answer. No, I will just mess it around. So, hey, Tony, do you do you do any joke writing, any clean joke writing, or yeah, how, yeah. what? How does your joke writing process change from your dirty joke writing process? I don't really have. I don't really have dirty versus clean joke writing i just have it i just try to think of my life and i like um i get a joke about a certain element of my life and I'm like okay now i want to see if anything can come before or after that joke and make a chunk out of it you know like i'll have an idea but if you just have one idea that's a subject that's just loose it's not really satisfying to it even if the joke's good it's just kind of dangling so I like the big little chunks, like, okay, I have this little idea here. It's kind of funny. Let's mail, make a little story, either something before it, something after it, and, if, and try to gain a little, make those chunks bigger out of one joke, become three jokes, become four jokes, become a chunk, you know? So I, that's what I try to work on. Like right now, I'm trying to work on a bit how my wife makes more money than me. I got about five jokes. I'd like to get that up to like a whole chunk, you know? How long is a chunk in minutes? I think of it as, as like whatever it is, you know, like a chunk could be anywhere from a couple minutes to it could be 10 minutes, could be 15. Like if, it, you know, it depends on the subject. If some people have one man shows about one subject, you know, you have little yeah. asides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I think, what is it? The Gary Goldman is like six, six to seven minute subjects are good for TV because that's a TV spot is a six or seven. I don't know if that's even 
Wow. Thing anymore. Now that late night is, you know, yeah. but that six or seven minute chunks is what you tried to work for as a TV spot. And then an hour for the headlining. Dude, that's, I haven't heard that about it being equivalent to being a TV chunk, the six to eight minutes. Yeah. That's fucking great. And like, for me, it's like, it's like, I have to think of it as like six minute installments because it's a multiple of three and everything's a multiple of three. Yeah. So that's, that's the same thing. Six so, minutes, like when clubs yeah. or festivals want to see a tape, it's always like six minutes. So that's, yeah. I think those chunks are good to get a collection of those, you know, dude. Wow. There's so much game right here. That's so awesome. Not that man. I do it. I've got to to do it. <laughs> but you're no, I mean, you're, 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 it sounds like, that's what this, good comics should do. Well, you're talking about this new chunk with 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 your wife and like you're trying you got five jokes and you're trying to make into a bigger chunk. And so, I mean, I had this Girl Scout cookie joke. I mean, I don't start it off like that. I talk about how I moved from Oakland. There's this fucking city. You don't kid. start off saying I got this Girl Scout cookie joke. <laughs> I do not. And I don't fucking do a survey before the show. Hey, do you guys want to hear me talking about my day job? You know, I'm just kidding because if you well, want to I only hear survey, I only hear one survey the most. Who you want to hear a clean joke or a dirty joke? That's oh. the survey I hear on the road and it's Oh my god. Clean joke never wins. It could be a it could be a nun school and it'd be <laughs> like dirty joke, right? You know what? I'm so cheap, but at the same time, I was like really fucking like not in a good place mentally, so I was just like do you guys want a clean joke? Do you guys want clean jokes or dirty jokes? Because I will do clean jokes right now if you guys want me to. Because nobody's paying attention, so I don't care if I bomb. I really don't. I literally did a show this past Saturday. I'm not going to say with who or where, but, like, literally, there was a fucking Chargers game going on, and people were like, you're setting up a joke. Woo, yeah, touchdown! And I'm just like, dude, I didn't even get to the punchline yet. Calm down. Like, it's fine. And so, like, and then there was, like, the people in the front would be laughing, but then the people in the back would be just getting louder and louder. So it's just, like, you know, it's, like, cutthroat comedy. You yeah. Know, it's, it's, like, football season comedy. And it's just, like, nobody hates sports more than me. Like, you know. During a, maybe, during a oh, yeah, I've had some bad experience. But that's, that's, when you, that's when you really, like, when you get to a comedy club, it's such a luxury because there's not a, there's not a pool table. The people are there to see comedy. Um you know, it's a, uh, it's like, oh, oh, this is ideal situation. It doesn't happen very much, but you know, it, you really, a bar show and a comedy club show are so different, you know? Oh, absolutely. No, I mean, like I was saying, like it was, um, the layover in Oakland could be such a like kill or be killed situation. And I saw a lot of fucking people die in that room. A lot of seasoned comics die in that room. I have died in that room. I've killed in that room, but I've also fucking eating like the biggest dick there like uh but like also i'm just like oh god i'm never gonna get booked again it's like hey great set i'm like thanks <laughs> just like that was not great but it's like i got some chuckles versus no but so there's some people that did not get any chuckles and i got some chuckles and like for me that's a bomb well if you're working on something oh I've no never seen, i've was... never seen a comic always do good that's a sign that you're a very middle of the road act if you always do well but if you hit and miss, that's how you got to find you. You didn't know pain, no gain. You don't know if something's not going to work until you, okay, I need some more work. I'm going to form it. I'm going to shape it. I'm going to switch words around. But if you just always do, okay, that means to me, you're not trying new jokes. Right. And like the thing with trying new jokes, because like I have like a bunch of repeat customers, well, repeat people that come to my show. Some, in some cases, fans that come to my shows, like when I'm in Santa Rosa, they'll come to my shows. And um, I always feel like I need to give them something new every yeah, fucking yeah. time and like i threw in this joke about when i got arrested in 1997 when i got uh caught shoplifting at long's drugstore and so like i go into it about talking about the tobacco aisle and all this shit so like i turned it i don't know like during the pandemic i thought of all these repressed memories and i was like oh shit i just wrote two hours of shit like this is awesome yeah um, not to say oh i have two hours you know it's just like let's see how i could turn this into an hour let's see but it's how, funny I can... how you look back at your life and you're like why didn't i talk about it earlier you know these things sometimes you watch comedy and they talk people talk about their life so naturally and you're just like it, it kind of like oh when you when you think if i can't think of what to write you just look at your life like oh yeah that's weird you know like right even something dumb like oh it's it's hot right now i hate it i'm a fat guy it's summer but i used to love summer as a kid that's the, that's the start of a joke that's oh, the start of, yeah, I, I, yeah, I used to, I, summer used to be the favorite. I was no school. You go on vacation. <laughs> now it's like, fuck, it's just a sizzling fucking heat. 
I'm sweating. I'm miserable. You know, what happened to the, where, 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 where did summer go? Or my, you know. In the same vein, but different joke. I have a joke like that about how I love summer because it's the fucking equalizer for skinny people because there's like, oh my God, I'm sweating profusely. It's hard to breathe. And I'm just like, welcome to my world, motherfucker. <laughs> and so like, that's how I feel about it. Like with the, with, so it's like in the same vein, it's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Being fat in summer. And it's just like, no, no, everyone's sweaty. So yes, it's like, it's like every day is, every day's fat. Every day summer when you're fat. Yeah, that's, that's, see, that's your, that's a funny, that's a funny only you take on that. And I think that's, that's and something it, that you're just like, oh, this is happening to me. Here's how it strikes <laughs> me. And if you can communicate that well, I mean, that's, you know, that's the, that's why it's a fun job. It's like, like it's on, it's partially honest. And then yeah. you can exaggerate and stuff. Yes. But I think yes. But dude, it's just, you got to know. I mean, like for me, I'm a horrible fucking liar. Horrible. So like, I have to legitimately remember the sequence of my stories or where I could add new shit in my sequence of stories or uh -huh. add one liners in my sequence of stories and then add new stuff. And so, or like go like, Oh, this is a whole new set. And so this is what I'm doing for my new 15 because during uh, the pandemic, like I told myself, you're writing a 15 minute set that's clean and you're writing a 15 minute set in Spanish that doesn't have to be clean, but it has to be in Spanish. That's and crazy. so, you know, and I can't do comedy in Spanish clean. I cannot. I cannot not talk about my dick in Spanish. I cannot not talk about homoeroticism and homophobia in Spanish. Like, that's not clean territory in Spanish. So it's just like, I like to talk about the hypocrisies within our culture or within the Latino culture. Well, I'm including you since you're, you know, 40% now. So, you know, us Spick brothers need to keep together. Um, First of all, thanks for counting that. Um that uh, website uh, <laughs> website <laughs> oh my god you're a beaner with a hard r um <laughs> i'm a bean x bean x <laughs> oh that's so fucking great oh god oh uh, dude you really you gotta grow out the, the mustache bro yeah. like, you gotta get that really like hey bro yeah, Decent, gotta... man. you know then you don't got a wife no more you got a high now all right. Yeah, so don't ever, don't ever call you your, your, your wife again. Heine. Heine. Then, yeah. I have a joke about that too. It's just like, you know why Mexicans call their women Heinas? Because they don't know how to say vaginas. <laughs> and like, it's a stupid joke. It's a stupid joke, but it's like, <laughs> Hey, that's kind of like a quick one up front somewhere, you know, <laughs> the kills in Mexican rooms, dog. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the white people are like, Oh my God, that's scary. What's a spick? <laughs> You're looking at it one. All anyway, right. No. Um, so uh, what's it called? Do you have any advice for comedians moving to Los Angeles? Um, yeah. Stay where you are. <laughs> the stage time is better where you are. You're getting spots. You're kind of a hot deal where you are. You know, you got your choice. It's it's Monday night. There's a couple spots you could do. Dude, just do or do that. Stay where you are until you got a manager and then you can move down here because it's brutal down here. As you know, it's brutal. Stage time sucks here compared to oh, wherever dude. you're from. Oh my God. Well, especially the Bay because the Bay, it's like, we're going to give you, oh, oh, you just started comedy. Oh, we'll give you nine minutes. We'll give you 12 minutes. It's, we'll give you 15 minutes. And I'm like, what the fuck? And then over here, they're like, you want to pay $5 for yeah. five minutes? And I told somebody, I was at a clean open mic at, at Laugh Factory and then one of the people i recognized from an open mic who was working there and uh she told me hey there's an open mic like a couple buildings down it's a great deal it's 10 minutes for five dollars and i was like what do you mean 10 minutes for five dollars you pay five dollars you do 10 minutes she's like yeah that's a steal and i told her i'd rather suck 20 guys dicks right now who all have hiv and take just massive cum shots and get hiv than fucking pay to be a comedian because that's bullshit that's like yeah, there's no clubs like that, right? The four wall or third, third. There's a the, whole the, third. the fourth. The fourth wall has now because they no longer have a bringer model. They have a door deal model, which is an incentivized bringer show where you keep half the door. And oh, so okay. if you bring your people, those tickets are five or ten bucks. Every ticket you keep five, and that's not a bad deal because really when you do an off night show at most comedy clubs, unless the producer is being super generous, you're not going to get paid shit, nothing, zero dollars. And I've, I've been to places where like people bring like a hundred fucking people 
to like the San Jose Improv, like on a Tuesday or on a Wednesday. And it's just like they get paid zero dollars, but they're oh. like, take taking all the pictures. Oh my God, look, we have a comedian. Look at all my fans. It's like, no, that's your family and supporters. Yeah, it's yeah, not, it's, your, it's your secretaries at work. And, and I'm not jealous or anything. It's just more good for you, but stop. Don't pick the funk like that. Like, you're not yeah, fucking, yeah, yeah. you're not like, so it's just like, I don't know. So, like, for me, I'm even like more like, I don't know, reserved to even just be like, oh, yeah, I have a fan base. You know, it's just like, you know, I'm grateful. I want to come out and check out your set sometimes. Uh, I have to I have to come out and let's let's hit a mic or something, man. That'd be yeah, fun. man, I'm fucking down, dude. I fucking um also um yeah, I could recommend you to the spot where dude has a show. I think like twice a month in Anaheim, and then like it's like sixty minutes, and like it's not horrible. But sixty like, minute spots. Yeah, I did my first hour. And like, oh. and it was funny as fuck because he was all like, "How comfortable are you doing an hour?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm totally comfortable." Never done it, but uh, I didn't tell him that last part. But so I was just like, so it, it went over pretty good. I went, like, if I got a bunch of followers. Oh, and, that's that's amazing because that's a that's a pretty rare opportunity in LA to do that much time. Man. Anaheim, Anaheim. I had to get the fuck out of fucking LA. I mean, I had to drive an hour to get there. I almost canceled because my nerves were all over the place. Like I was emotional. I was an emotional that's wreck. A funny feeling, isn't it? Like you want to just like you know what I I. There's part of me that wants to quit. Like getting the work is the, always the fun. You're like I have this work. It's two weeks away. I got this gig. But when you're getting ready for gigs, like God, part of me, a little part of me wants to cancel because it's just so comfortable and convenient. Then you always do it and it's fine, you know, whatever. Uh, but there's that little I, thing, that little scariness. And I think it's healthy. But dude, I had never done an hour before. That yeah, was the crazy. thing, and that was like. And then when I got the light, I was all like, Hey. I've never done an hour before. I told the dude I did. I told the host and I fucking shouldn't have done that because she's cool with the host. Hella cool with the host. I was like, fuck. But anyway, she, when she gave me the, I was like, I don't know. I don't know how to time the last 10 minutes. So can you just give me a two minute line? I'll just get the fuck off stage. It's like, sure. So she gave me the two minute light and I still had like 30 minutes of material that I had like prepared for that night because I pretended that the guy told me you got to do two hours. Oh, that's good. So I did that and I was like, okay, cool. So I only had like an hour and a half of the two hours. Like, <laughs> So I was you just had like, fake, you, had, you had to fake your, you had to self hack yourself, dude. It was fucking incredible, man. I was like, what should I talk about? I'm like, oh, and I was going on riffs and rants and talking about different shit. And like, I didn't do a lot of crowd work, but I did a little crowd work because I do elephant talks, um, because I have a deviated septum and I, you know, I could, uh -huh. like, so it's, oh shit, my dog just went off right now. <laughs> I scared the shit out of my dog. Sorry. That's baby. how real that shit is. <laughs> <laughs> she thought there was an actual like, I got a in pachyderm in the living room now. Dude, I <laughs> pachyderm. That's fucking that's 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 fancy talk. I like it. Yeah. Um ladies, stop recording fucking podcast. Don't be like that. All right. Um, no respect, no respect. Um, I have a question. Um, so um <clears throat> I understand the importance of the vouch to get into comedy clubs and festivals, but what makes a good tape to submit to comedy clubs and festivals? I'm the wrong guy to ask. I've never. <laughs> Sorry. I, I remember. No, I remember sending out when I lived in the San Francisco comedy condo. I remember sending out, you know, like stacks of, of VCR tapes where you're walking to the post office was on the corner of 21st and Geary Street. Uh, so many tapes. I don't think I got shit from anything I've ever sent out. I, I, I've even applied for festivals. I sent a, you know, tape. I don't, I, it's not, it's just something from like the Denver Comedy Works or something. I have never gotten anything. I've only gotten things from people seeing me live. Like I got, that's how I got Cohen is Bob Odenkirk saw me at Aspen and recommended me. I only oh, get, shit. I only got, I only, it's like, I'm not good to take. I've never, that's, I, I've never really had like, any positive experience from sending a, a submission, you know? Well, I mean, I don't know. It's just like, I've been not, what the fuck? I when I moved, I would not do it. It's just my personal. I don't oh. come across well. I think. Oh, no, I mean the reason why I ask is like from my personal experience, like moving to L.A. And the thing I fucked up was I didn't make any contacts here before I moved. I just abruptly moved here, so I was like uprooted and moved here. And so like, oh, I'm a fucking you know, <laughs> it's like I'm doing. Um, I came here to fucking be a stand up, and now I'm a podcaster and a writer. So it's like I'm and not complaining. And a stand up. Because and out of those three, it's like I've only been professionally paid for stand up while down here. And so I'm not yeah. trying to flex, but I mean, it's like I'm like pretty close to getting my first professional writing gig and I don't want to fuck it up. And so I don't want to jinx it by being like, oh, and this is what it's about. And this is who it's with and blah, blah, blah. And this is, you know, it's like I'm on the ground up for this show. And it's just like like it's through the vouching system. 
And what's fucked up is that one of the dudes that vouched for me is a writer and he used to, um, he was part of the Boston comedy scene, but he doesn't do stand up because he's a writer. And like him vouching for me made all this other shit like go through really well. And so the vouching. Yeah, right. I think vouching for writing, you know, when you, when you read someone's writing, it's, it's, it's a real investment in time. And so, hey, read my script or, you know, that's like, I, I read them twice. Yeah, it's a long time, but like, no you see somebody when you see somebody you're like oh this guy's great it's live it's an easy vouch but like i think when people vouch for writers it's it almost has more thing because like i'm in this business you know and you're another writer as soon as you read this you'll either you the jig is up or not you, you, you know you can say someone's funny and ah, i have an off night but the writing speaks for itself you know i mean so I think when someone recommends you they you send your script over and they oh yeah i like it it's not my cup of tea you know yeah More exactly of a, more of a, a, a clear job ladder or whatever, you know. Like a- I mean, like for me, it's like I have and I don't know how to I'm not going to mince words here. I have uh, traditionally been treated uh-huh. like I'm like I'm retarded. And so like for, I don't know, respectable people to be giving me like the time of day to be like, what do you think about this? I'm like, what the fuck? You really give a shit about my creative process? Like all this fucking time I've been fucking around trying to just like, you know, scare away the depression by trying to be funny and like, you know, um, I don't yeah, know. I remember one of the first uh, network shows I had, uh, you know, it's all these Harvard guys, you know, some people who have been on um, Simpsons and stuff. And they're like, oh, what do you think, Tony? I was like, geez, they want, they're really asking, you know, I was a very new writer, but they, they want, so I'd say my thing, they're laughing. Like, I don't mean the Simpson guys laugh. And it's just like, you forget that your experience is just different. It's not, you know, you think of family members. I have some hilarious friends who crack me up. They're not professional comedians. It's, it's, if you just, the way to be funny is just be yourself and authentic, you know, and, and, and Thank whether you. it's writing or whether it's stand up, and if you just, you're really yourself, people, you know, it doesn't matter if they're smart and I'm like, this guy's a funny guy, you know, it's like, where you're like undeniable, that guy's a funny guy, like, or whatever. The majority of my friends that are successful did not go to a four-year university, do not have a four-year degree, don't even have a two-year degree. And I don't say like not even, but I mean, like I had somebody today tell me because I wrote a spec script for an animate, a well-known animated cartoon. And um, I wanted people's honest opinion about it. And I told, I told this woman who's my wife's cousin's cousin, I don't know, any rate. So that's a relationship. And so I told her about it. She's like, oh, I would love to read it, but I don't think you would like my opinion because I don't even have an AA. And I'm like, that's no, I never even thought about that. I've read well, some you, of your you writing. You don't have to be an alcoholic to enjoy a good script. I don't understand that. <laughs> Dude, yeah. but that's what I'm saying, though. It's just like she really like was insecure about me wanting to share my script with her and asking her for her feedback. I'm like, you watch The Simpsons, right? You know, she's like, yeah. And I was like, I wrote a spec script for The Simpsons. And it's a try to get my foot in the door with a writing sample type of thing. And it's like, I haven't heard anyone shit on it. And it's, I don't know if anyone's not sparing my feelings or if it's good, but it Is was she like, a writer. Yes. Okay. So she's a writer and I had uh, somebody else look at it and they're That's like, a weird thing to say is I don't have an AA because if, if you're a writer, you're already doing it. So it's weird. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is like uh, from a, like a, a, a community college, or mm-hmm. like from like anywhere, it's like people put too much stock in degrees. But what about all the dumb fucks I went to university with that I walked with were stupider than shit? Like, you know what I mean? Like they're just living off the teat of their family and their parents and their wealth. And they're not really doing anything like with uh, anything they did with college. I mean, even with me, I substitute teach. You have to have a four year degree to substitute teach. You do now or you do in California. And so or at least the public schools and private schools, they make their own rules. So. Uh, with public schools, you have to have a four-year degree. You have to pass the California Basics Educational Skills Test, the CBES, and um, you have to have your tuberculosis test. You got to have your uh, FBI, Department of Justice, uh, fingerprinting done, and then you're free to go. But that's it. That's all you need to be a substitute teacher. And then people are like, you did all that? You don't have a record? You have a four-year degree? You don't have tuberculosis? Like, you know what? It's just like, fuck. I mean, I know I know I look unhealthy as shit, but I don't think I look like I have tuberculosis. But um, I, what the fuck does it look like to have tuberculosis? Anyway, but um, I don't know. Like, I just think this whole process was with stand up. Like, I think it's so like it's so interwoven, like even with just like the the the, the weed community within stand up, 
Like, you know, it's like we're all connected through the weed. We're all connected through the stand up. We're all connected through this weed in stand up. And like there's been moments where I've been able to talk to comics and normally wouldn't be able to talk to because I have a joint and I'm at a comedy club and I'm passing it to like people like, oh, fuck, you're smoking that stinky ass weed. Like, yes, this is all I smoke because I don't get high off the other shit. So this is what I'm smoking. And it's just like I've been able to talk to people that I normally wouldn't be able to talk to because I've had weed or because I'm smoking. Uh, I'm sorry, because I'm smoking weed or having a drink or whatever. And so it's just like, yeah, that's, not- a, that's a newish thing, because, you know, like when I first started, it was a while ago, you couldn't even <laughs> have, you couldn't have like ripped jeans, you know, like you, you it what? Was like on a weekend at the improv. Oh, you know? oh, 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 would they tell you? Yeah, they would just, like I went down with Greg Barrett and some friends when a uh, day Becky was running the Irvine Improv and you know he had some ripped jeans like not not on my stage with the ripped jeans not on, not on the Saturday and Friday the big shows you could do maybe Thursday maybe something you know <laughs> and then just nice jeans but ripped up is like that's we've come a long way where you weekend headliners were wear a blazer and now you know it's like community weed weed is most comics I would say most comics smoke weed now yeah a lot don't but like. You know, I don't. Or is a thing, and it's like I think it's weed comics are cool. I have a lot of friends who don't smoke weed. It's just just as cool, you know, because you know the weed thing could be crutch for some comics. Or I've seen some some bad behaviors um, on some people we were talking about before the oh yeah, yeah, yeah. recording who were like, what they, they, they the middle's done. No, they're out smoking pot. They're supposed to be hosting the show. Oh, no, little no, things like no. that where it affects work negatively. So I think it, it's <laughs> good, but it's also you know everything's got you got to do it in context and you know i mean yeah but i mean it's also knowing when to smoke you know oh Uh, yeah you know everybody's got and again that's everybody's different some people like to go up high i mean i remember this guy there was a radio show in san francisco alex bennett showed all the comics would do it and he'd have live he would go like go to Cobbs and and he would have the broadcast from Cobbs at 6 a.m and uh oh shit yeah, and I remember going down there. It's like five thirty, and Proops is like, "Hey, buddy, you want to get high?" I'm like, "Dude, it's five <laughs> thirty in the morning." Uh, but it's Greg Proops. Yes, yes, I'll get high at five thirty in the morning uh, with Greg Proops. And he, you know, it's, it's like one of those things. Like, how did I get? Why is it? It's five. It's six o'clock in the morning. I'm stoned. <laughs> what the fuck's going on? I got, I got a new radio, like this popular radio show. You know, it's like, uh, you're high as fuck. You know, it's yeah. just, oh, that's so beautiful, man. It's funny because it's just like, I don't know. The the things they tell you not to do growing up are the things that like open doors for you as a comedian. And it's like so yeah, surreal. It's just like, and yeah, it's and just then, like summer. Things change. You used to love it. Now you hate it. Well, yeah. I mean, like, again, like, you know, with opening for your heroes type of thing, it's just like, I don't know. I had, I had an interaction with somebody I haven't mentioned at all. And like, it was um, for something else. And it was like, it had nothing to do with stand up. And it was, they were not the nicest. And I was just like, dude, like I'm like a huge fan of yours. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, we got to get lunch and get some time and catch up on all the real names of this. Yeah, thing. that's hilarious. Like, I wish I've been I... redacted for this conversation. Oh my god, I know. And I was just like, I'm not going to mention the cartoon. I was like, The Simpsons. But anyway, <laughs> um, that's. But like, I got to jump sh- off. I'm sorry, yeah, brother. No, 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 no. Uh, talk with you. No, but I gotta absolutely. Do yes, yes. Uh, Tony, before we go, last question. Uh, where can the people find you at home? At home. <laughs> that's an where easy can, one where can people find you on social media or on the internets uh, or is there anything you want to promote is this probably going to come out this coming tuesday i got nothing to promote i i was supposed to be at the alameda comedy club but i think that got pushed back um nothing to promote um i'm gonna maybe do a tour of england in october and september but i don't promote that because i don't even have any dates yet um what was the other thing? Oh, social media, Face, Facebook. I have Twitter and um, Instagram. I don't barely go to them because I'm an old man. But uh, there, I'm there. I'm gonna, my, ta- I'm gonna tag you. A lot of my cats and dogs and stuff. No, well, that's 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 awesome, man. Like I love cats and dogs, man. Yeah, so it's um, a lot of just my animals in my house. But um, I think we'll do a fall tour of the Bay Area after I get back from London, from England, and then uh, who knows? But uh, let's hook up sometime. You're a fun guy. I like to talk to yeah, you. Yeah, bro. I'm I'm down, man. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode. And real I really fun. Th- You're a good host. Oh, thank you, brother. I really appreciate you saying that, man. I really tried my hardest, and I'm just all like, fuck. I want Tony to like me. I no, mean, <laughs> I, was a bad, I was a bad guest with my shitty internet. No, you right were a great time. guest. It was like I I just was really I was happy the way that it turned out, even when you were absent. 
Dirty. That was my favorite part. To be honest. <laughs> you're like, yeah, you're just like, just that's when you were the best people. host is when I was. When you were. <laughs> yeah. You're just like, like yeah, this you're guy just really like, listens. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, did this guy, I was like, did he just walk out of the show? Is, I don't know. I almost walked one of my, I almost walked Ty Rivera because I asked him a very, I asked him a racial question and well, he thought I was yeah, pressing his buttons and I wasn't <laughs> pressing his buttons. I was just asking. You know, but anyway, I'm not would like it if he pressed his buttons. No, no, no. I'm too fat. I'm going to lose weight just for him so I can press his buttons. No, nah, Ty's, Ty's a good friend of mine. I love Ty. Shout out to Ty. Oh, he's uh, he's shout a out funny to- guy. But let's face it. Ichabod Crane is too fat for Ty Rivera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't. Well, yeah, dude. He's, 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 you know, I, I would, I would definitely say that that Ty's a muscle daddy for sure. Oh, yeah. Not, yeah, not yeah. my muscle daddy, but just a muscle daddy. Very entertaining <laughs> young man. Absolutely, man. And you're a very entertaining man yourself, man. sir. I, 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 I know you're not that old. And even if you are that old, I'm still going to die before you. I so heard it. I'm an old fucking man. Oh, dude, that's nice. Well, anyway, yeah, I'd love to catch lunch, man. Let's fucking do it. Um, and, well, thanks for uh, having me on, Victor. Yeah, brother. Thank you for being here. Love you so much. Thank you guys so much. And uh, please continue listening to our shows. And man, this was a great episode. Thank you so much, yeah, Tony. Fun. Talk soon, man. Absolutely, brother. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, do your boy a favor. Tell your friends. Tell your cool family members. Tell your cool co-workers. Let them know about the podcast. And leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. And be sure to follow me on all social media, Puro Papi Pacheco. And check out my website at HispanicTitanic.com for future dates. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you on the next one. Have a great day.